and let me just give an introduction and then we'll go on. Okay, hi everyone. So today we are doing a live stream with some guests talking about connections to category theory. This is something that several people have requested. Frankly, I'm always afraid of category theory. Category theory is sort of the, the purports to be the most abstract current game in town for thinking about mathematical kinds of things. And uh, I have only very slowly understood a very small amount about category theory, but it is clear from the small amount that I understand that it has lots of relevance to things that we're doing. And so our goal today is to try to uh, understand more about relations of our physics project to category theory. And I do have to tell one story here related to Fabrizio, who's, who's uh, joining us um, uh, today. The, the, how I met Fabrizio, um, we were at um, South by Southwest conference at the trade show there. And there was a whole, there were a whole bunch of um, wild things at the trade show. And you know, you walk up to one booth and you ask, what do you do? And the person says, we are releasing, uh, we want to, we have a giant industrial robot and we're going to make it uh, dance. Another person says, um, uh, we are, uh, there's real things from that actual trade show that we're, we're, um, we've got a scheme for having satellites release uh, stuff into the upper atmosphere to generate giant continent sized firework displays. Then I walk up to this next booth and I say, what do you do? And uh, that was Fabrizio. And he said, I do categorification of Petri nets. <laughs> I was like, that's, that's very different from the robot next door. Um, but uh, anyway, that started a, a bunch of very interesting conversations. Actually, I, I don't know if you know this, that I realized that you were Stephen Wolfram only like 20 minutes in the conversation. Yeah, yeah, I, I figured that. <laughs> that, that was, that was um, yeah, no, it was, it was, that was why that made the whole thing more amusing that, that uh, it's like there are robots and there's categorification of Petri nets. Yeah. Bartley. I remember at some point I probably asked, uh, you probably told me, oh yeah, in uh, Mathematica we are doing this and that. And I was like, oh, I do you work uh, with uh, Wolfram Mathematica? And you yeah. were like, well, actually I created it. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was a good conversation. It was uh, one of many. Um, so, so let's see, for, for us today, um, what, where should we start? Uh, I think um, let, let's maybe... Uh, start off talking about kind of the, the the modern view of what is category theory. I mean, you know, category theory originated in um, uh, you know in the world of sort of organizing algebraic topology and things like that, yeah. and it's been through. So, so maybe you guys, I'm I'm curious if you guys can sort of characterize how should one think about category theory today. Uh, well, I think that the uh, initial insight of category theory is still. Uh, the right one. Uh, basically, as you said, um, category theory is being created right from the start as a sort of unification theory. Uh, basically, in the 40s and the 50s, you know, there were, there was a lot of work that was being done in mathematics in uh, areas with some overlaps. So maybe, you know, people were studying structures that were at the same time geometric and algebraic and stuff like this. And uh, people found themselves in this uh, weird circumstance where they had very well developed theories of, you know, the single things, like there was a very well developed theory of groups, of rings, of topological spaces, but then studying how these things interacted uh, was actually very difficult. And then at some point people started to think, oh, maybe we need a theory to talk about the relationships between different theories. Um, and actually, I think that one of the reasons why category theory earned, you know, this infamous, uh, this fame of being super complicated is because the kind of stuff that motivated the creation of category theory was actually super complicated. And so, unfortunately, <laughs> the, like, normally per people were inducted to category theory just from the worst part of it, from the most complicated part of it. And that probably didn't help, you know, people say, okay, I, I can understand this. But hey, by the way, for better, just a practical point, is it possible for you to move closer to the microphone or some, some, in some other way uh, can yeah. make it um, less echoey? It's just a bit, um, it's, it's, it, we can oh, hear you, but it's... Does it work better like this? 
No, because we're hearing the echo from the room. I think. I think that's the problem. Oh. Yeah. That, uh, uh, so that that's not that's not fixable. Okay. No. No problem. The, unless I... anybody else has another idea how to how to improve that. Uh, are you sure you're using that microphone as opposed to your computer's microphone? Uh, I think I am. I can try with another one uh, that could probably work better. Let's see. Okay. You could pad the wall. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's usually mo most, if you, it looks like you're in kind of an office-like setting, oh, maybe. In. Yeah. Oh, that's that's a lot better, actually. Nice. Cool. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. Yes. I had two microphones and I was using the wrong one. Sorry. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, we we were... So category theory, it's classic use in thinking about kind of the correspondence between different kinds of arguments and different kinds yes. of mathematical structures. Yes, and uh, then um, fast forward uh, a few decades, uh, people started realizing that this theory, you know, was actually useful also to for talking about um, applied stuff. And uh, the reason for that is that in the end, category theory, uh, since it studies the relationship between very difficult, very different entities, um, it's actually pretty good to describe complex systems, like you know many applied systems are. Um, probably the first two biggest success um, successes in applying category theory have been uh, functional programming. Uh, which is basically entirely founded on, on category theory. And you see, I find that very amusing. I find that statement very amusing because I've, you know, for 40 years or something, I've built functional programming languages. And yet, if, if that's a true statement, I really need <laughs> to understand it because I don't understand that at all. Um, well, uh, I mean, as soon as you say the important thing in, the, the, in a program are functions, Yes. then you want to say everything you can about how these functions compose. And at that point, you know, all the machinery that category theory gives you becomes very, very useful. Uh, it's, it's actually strange because in the end, when you like do Haskell or stuff like that, you are still working, let's say, in the category of sets, like all your functions are functions between sets. But the point of view of category theory is radically different and 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 that's what actually gives you something um nice see, see for example in in symbolic functional language like wolfram language mm -hmm. the 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 idea of mapping between sort of kinds of objects is very weird and it's something that you know like uh, you know the denotational semantics guys and dana scott and so on for, for 40 years, Dana has been sort of, I think, a little bit confused about how it fits into that way of thinking, because what we're dealing with is sort of, you know, we have these symbolic expressions, and they're general symbolic expressions, and we're making transformations on those. And that's different from saying, you know, the symbolic expressions have a, have a life of their own. It's not just, it's a thing in this pool of possible things of a certain type. I mean, maybe we should, maybe this is the wrong, I mean, maybe a characterization Thing I'm curious about. So you're you're saying, and I'd like to understand this correspondence that you're describing between between functional languages and, and category theory. But um, uh, you know, maybe I can ask. I mean, uh, you know, in my efforts to understand what category theory is, and you know, morphisms, all these kinds of things. I mean, there's some structural aspects of category theory which are a bit like graph. You know, that where you're dealing with things like graphs. Is that a, a fair? I mean, and it but is. they're graphs with certain special associativity properties on their on their edges. Is that it, a, a true even statement? more, actually, um, basically, you can see a, a category as the transitive closure of a graph. So the idea is that every time yes. you have an edge from A and B and one from B and C, you also have one from A and C that represents the composition of the two. Uh, and in the and also you have identities. So for each vertex of the graph, you want an edge that is the do nothing kind of thing um, that goes from a from A to A and it's just a loop. Uh, mm -hmm. And you you can see that basically if you give me a graph, I have a canonical way of building a category out of this graph. So I basically take the edges and I complete adding formally all the possible compositions and the identities. 
And this is a, exactly called the free category generated by a graph. And you can also do the opposite. Like you can uh, take a category and forget that it's a category and just treat it as it was a graph, basically. And the nice thing about category theory is that you can see, say that these operations are actually a couple of a joint functors. So what it means is that it's not just like that I can build a category out of a graph. It's also that if you give me a graph transformation, I can map it to a transformation of the corresponding categories. And again, that's pretty much obvious because if you, if you tell me this vertex goes to this vertex and this edge goes to this edge, then I can formally extend this mapping to all the formal compositions that I introduced in the categorical world. So, so hold on a second. So let, let me see if I understand what you're saying. Let me, let me, let's, um, let's actually start. Um, unfortunately, the way I have my computer set up today, it's going to be difficult for me to... Uh, all right, let's let's do this. Okay, so let's say you're saying we have some random graph. So we, yes. we might have some uh, some graph that just looks like. Here, let me make this even bigger. Um, Actually, random directed graph. Okay, all right. You want a random directed graph? Let's make a random directed graph. How big would you like it to be? Let's just have ten. Uh, let's do something like this. There's a round. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's let's make sure. Um, actually, I'm not sure. Let's see. Let's see if we say directed edges arrow true. Okay. There's a random directed graph. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So we can take. You you mentioned transitive closure. I mean, we could say let's get the uh, whoops the transitive closure graph for this graph. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. So it's a, the transitive closure is a big mess. Yes. And also you want to join identities. So for each... Okay. For, so we want self loops for every one of them. Yes. Okay. So we could do that. We could just say, um, uh, I don't know how we best do this, but, but um, well, let's say we just get, um, uh, let's say, I mean, just, just to draw a definite graph, let's append to the edge list of this graph a um, something that says actually let's join to the edge list of that graph something that maps hash goes to hash over the vertex list of that graph mm -hmm. um, and then let's say uh, make a graph out of that so this should have little ears on there we go okay all nice. right um, actually uh, when you uh, did the transitive closure there, it's uh, automatically like uh, recursively done or you're yes. just, okay, cool. So yeah, basically this would be the underlying graph to the free category coming from the graph above. Well, I say that this is the underlying graph because at the moment, this, uh, it, when, when we look at this graph, obviously we cannot tell that the loops have to behave like identities, for instance, uh -huh. or, that, or that some things that we are introducing are compositions of edges. This information is somehow forgotten from the categorical structure. But this is exactly the underlying structure of the free category generated by the graph above. But a cool thing okay. is that if you map, if you go all the way up to the, our first graph and you map it, to some other graph. And by mapping, I mean, we have a function from vertexes to vertexes and a function from edges to edges so that uh, source and target of each edge are preserved. Mm -hmm. um, then the idea is that we can lift this to a morphism between the corresponding free categories. Let's start with something much simpler. Okay, so we've yep. got this graph and you say, so you're going to label every edge. Every edge is going to have an actual, we're going Perfect. to, they have actual names. Mm -hmm. Right? So um, uh, let's say edge labels, whether that's, and the, the um, okay, so then now everything has a name. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what am I going to do? So now I'm going to take this and for every one of those named vertices, I'm going to say two maps, so maybe I have some other graph here. Yes. And let, let's, let's make another graph. Um, uh, let's say, okay, there was another 
somewhat similar graph. Maybe I let me change some parameters here. Let me say, uh, let me say four vertices there and five edges. Okay, so there's another graph. Okay. okay. So now you're going to you're telling me make a mapping from this graph to this graph. Is that right? If you can, yes. Uh, it's not always possible, clearly, if you want to preserve source and target of each uh, arrow. But uh... well, but so so a mapping means what? It means I'm taking. It what, how, how should that, I think about this? I mean, um, it means that you are basically mapping uh, the vertexes of the first graph to the vertexes uh, of the second graph, as you want. And then yeah. you are mapping the edges of the first graph uh, to the edges of the second graph in a way so that the endpoints of the edges are compatible with the mapping you gave on the vertexes. So for instance, what I'm saying is that if you want to map two to three to something, uh, then you uh, basically have to make sure that the vertexes two and three get mapped to the vertexes of the target edge. So for instance, if you map three to two, uh, then you cannot map two to three to four to one, because in that case, you are losing the correspondence between uh, the source and the target of the edge. I think I need a much simpler example. Let's take, let's start off with something much more trivial, which I think is, is let's say I have a path graph. Mm -hmm. right? So, um, okay, there's my first graph. Yes, and let's perfect. say, um, and now, okay, and then I have another one of these. Let's say I have uh, five edges in that one. Yes. Okay, now what does it mean to do a mapping from one to another? Well, in this case, it means that you can map uh, every number in the first one to the same number or bigger in the second one. So for instance, if you, if you map one to one, two to two, three to three, and four to four, and you know you, all the edges to the edges um, between one, two, two, and three, three, and four, then that's a valid mapping. But for instance, if you map one to one and two to two, then you cannot map the edge that goes from one to two to the edge that goes from four to five because you are losing the endpoints. Let me see if I understand the context of this. So in, in traditional and in category theory, one thinks about, I mean, let's just do an example of this. Yeah. I mean, talking about this in terms of these, this is some morphism, if I understand correctly, mapping, uh, uh, just no, give, no, give me an case, example of what. So in this case, uh, what we are doing are we are defining a category of graphs. So actually, graphs will be the objects of our categories, and the mapping I'm talking about are the right kind of structure preserving morphism you want to pick. So the idea is, if you want to map. Uh, a graph to another graph. What is the relevant structure that you, you want to, this mapping to preserve? So for instance, in the case of a group, then we know that a mapping has to be an homomorphism because the relevant structure of the group is an operation. It's like the group multiplication and inverse. And we want mappings that preserve these, these operations. Otherwise, they don't make sense from the perspective of groups. So in this case, um, what is the relevant structure of a graph? Well, the relevant structure of, the, of a graph is just that each edge has a beginning and an end that are vertexes, basically, a source and a target, as we call them. Okay, but, but, but hold on a second. The, the, there's two different levels of, of what's going on here. I mean, there's the, you know, there's the objects that exist in this category, and yes. there's the actual sort of category theoretic layer and then maybe higher order category theoretic layers that correspond to um, uh, the um, um, uh, the, 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 I think we need to okay let me let me ask maybe Jonathan who understands more about what I at least understand to if, if he can comment on this because I'm getting super confused already 
um, what, what level of stuff we're talking about here. Because I think we're talking about the construction of a category that is being constructed out of graph as a category of graphs. Yes. Yet it seems like a lot of the structure of category theory operates at the level of talking about uh, transformations uh, within categories, between categories and so on, which themselves are represented as graphs or can yes. be represented. So, so, so yeah, exactly. There are two things. There's the, there's the category graph, which is the, which is the category that Fabrizio has been defining. There are also notions like the concept of a string diagram, which give you a combinatorial way of representing a category in which you see, so, so with, I mean, Fabrizio, correct me if I'm wrong, but so a string diagram, each vertex is a morphism, each edge is an object. And so it gives you a way, you know, given some arbitrary category, it gives you a way to, to, to uh, it gives you a combinatorial representation of the internet. Uh, yeah, like basically, yeah, string diagram is like you are dualizing things. So let's say that points become lines and lines become points. So yes. Like a mathematical example, in the case of groups, in the case of, if you really want algebraic topology, but it will be better if it was something less. Well, I mean, if you take that directed graph you generated above and you treat that as, you know, th that's some, some category. This then, thing here. Well, I mean, a, a, any of them, right? A, yes. Any of the ones that we generated to be, cat that, that's not a category. That's an object in a category. Yes. I mean, the category, the, the thing above. Sorry, this, this thing we're talking about is an object in a category, right? Yeah, yeah but, yes. but, abo but above you generated a, a thing that was supposed to be the, the representation yes, of a category, exactly. right? Which, 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 was the, which, which, which had the identities and has the transitive closure. So if okay, you take that fine. object, and you construct its dual. So you have vertices for, for where the morphisms are, and you have edges where the um, where, where the objects are. That would be a string diagram. Um, All right. Let, let's okay. To, to help me not get just irreducibly confused, can we talk about categories of things other than graphs? Because if we yes, yes. About but, but, but graphs. But the, the, but the thing you, the thing you constructed graphs, above, we that, that's we don't know what that's a category of. That's just a category okay. of objects. Yes, okay. and this is represented. So, so tell me so, what. So you can construct the string diagram of that. So what I'm, what I was trying to say before is that this, that thing here that we generated, that comes from a graph. Now the point is that uh, this thing doesn't just come from a graph. The point is that there is a relevant notion of transformation between graphs that will be transported to a relevant notion of transformation between categories. So a functor. And this thing is itself functorial. So what I was trying to say is that the category graph um, as a functor that goes to the category cat, where objects are categories and morphisms are functors. So in the end, this from the categorical point of view uh, says that, yeah, there is a very nice canonical way of building categories out of graphs. And this canonical way behaves well with respect to how you transform graphs that's basically the whole thing. okay and, and, let's, and let's let's come back the, again so, sorry I'm, for I'm, just, just one confused. quick question yeah um this this transformation this functorial transformation between graphs and and, and the category of graphs is uh, do you say that was an adjoint uh, yeah sort of, so there is a joint there is an adjoint from uh, graph to cat basically okay uh and uh, in from graph to cat you just create to build the free category out of each graph. And in the other way, uh, the other way around, you just forget that categories are graphs. So you, you take the category and you just consider it as a graph, basically. So I, say, I mean, cat, cat is the category of categories. Is that the idea? Yes, yes, correct. Okay. So we're already, we're already uh, in a little bit of deep, deep water here. By the time we, can, can we start off with, let's just take, a, for example, talking about, let's say functional programming or something mm -hmm. like that. Can we talk about a really elementary example yes, where absolutely. we can represent morphisms, functors, things like that in terms yes. of something concrete? So uh, one uh, easy example would be you can have a category where your objects are uh, types in, in your functional programming language and your morphisms- Well, actually in my life, we have a typeless language. So, okay, but let's, <laughs> let's assume we have types. Um, yes, uh, category theory is deeply connected to type theory. So basically everything we do is typed in a way or another. But, uh, anyway, so let's say we have a type, we have type of integers and we might have a type that is something like an array constructor type. We have, presumably we have a base type 
and we might have some constructor of types. Is that right? Uh, yes, the constructors though will be characterized as some other categorical things. So I would leave them out for now uh, because oh, but then uh, what we've got okay. So we've got a base type like integer. Now what do we do with? Then that? you can have, for instance, list int. So lists of integers. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Then I have a constructor. So the constructor... no, that's that's the point. Uh, list int is a type. List is a constructor. So list Fine. int is the constructor applied to the type. But if you want to describe list, then we'll need to talk about monads, and and that's the, the, probably the the next step. So um, yeah, you okay. Can so have we int. have we have a type like that, and we might have a type that's presumably list of list of int. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And and then basically. The idea is that you know you also you have functions between these types, and these are your morphisms in this case. Okay, so, so for example, I might have a function of an integer that returns an integer. Yes, exactly. Or I might that, have a function g of an integer that returns a list of integers. Yes, and this will be of type. Uh, the first one will go from int to int, and the second one will go from int to list int. Okay, so yes. so this one here is characterized as having type int arrow int yes okay all right yes. fine and that okay so so we've got two constructors here we've got the the um the arrow constructor basically and we've got the list constructor mm, correct yes so i i understand why you say that arrow is a constructor but uh Again, it depends at what level you look things. Uh, you look at things because you can say that f is just a morphism from int to int, and then you are basically saying actually int to int is a type, and that's that's true, obviously. But that depends on the fact that this particular category has a lot of nice machinery in it. So, in particular, the fact that uh, int to int is itself a type comes from the fact that the category is uh, called monoidal closed. Um, but uh, what it means is that basically you can consider that the morphisms between two objects in your category are themselves uh, an object. Okay, so, wait a so this, this mapping, a function returns something, that's the morphisms are the arrows. Is that correct here? Yeah, the morphism, like, yeah, so the, the idea is that, yeah, the morphisms are the arrows from a type to another type. Yes. Okay. All right. And then you agree that on each type, you have an identity arrow that is the, basically the, the morphism that does nothing. So, for instance, you can go from int to int and you just return what you got. Okay, so, so there's an identity morphism. For each which, type. Which, yes. is, which, which would be, have the property that it is basically... The identity, you know, it's it's essentially something that just takes any type and returns. That's it takes anything of that type. Is that correct? Takes anything of that um, type and returns this, a thing of the same. No, you have, you have to think. Uh, uh, yeah, the idea is that for each type, you will have a particular identity morphism. This is the equivalent of the loops we were putting. On no, I understand. The but so, give me a practical example of that. So. It, for an integer, for example, is the identity morphism the integer comes back as the integer? Yes, it, precisely. Yes. Okay, so it is in fact an identity operation. Is that correct? Yes. It's yes. not just that an integer comes back as another integer. It's the integer exactly. comes back as the same integer. Perfect. Is that true? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And okay. then you you see that we also have a notion of composition, namely if you have a function from A to B and one from B to C, you can just pipe one into the other and get a function from A to C. Okay, so hold on, hold on, hold on. So let, let me just understand that. So, so what you're saying is if F maps, if F of int returns an int, yes. and G of int returns a list of int, then I can perfectly well say uh, the, you know, F of G of int returns something which is a, in that particular case, a list of int. Um, uh, wait, no, it should be G of F, right? If G returns a list of int, then you can't apply F to it. Fine. So that's yes. a list of a, of a, well, I haven't represented this very well, but I understand that that, that thing's 
um, type signature is int goes to int, List int. goes to yes. Instrument. And when you compose, you are basically, let's say, forgetting what's in the middle. Then you are just saying that this goes from int to list of int. Yes. Yeah. So in this case, you see types are useful because they prevent you to compose apples, apples and oranges, basically. Like you, you can't compose if I, F goes I'm the wrong person to try and sell types to. But yes, I understand the idea. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I mean, I understand that types can get in the way, especially when you want to do like fast prototyping or development. It doesn't matter. Uh, we, we don't need to, the, 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 you know, the idea of types, I understand the idea of types, the, the kind of the, the calculus of types, you know, we've done a bunch of experiments with this. It's, it's not, I mean, we can argue about whether that's useful, but I don't think that's the main point here. And I, I, I want to understand, maybe you can finally explain more clearly than I've understood it before, things like the Haskell um, what is it? The Curry, what is it? How, what is Curry it? Howard, um, Curry Howard the isomorphism. Isomorphism, yes. Right. Um, but okay, so, so what I'm understanding here is that this is each one, t tell me the terms here. So the, the, this is, that, how would you describe this, this thing here? Uh, that thing, I would just not describe it at the moment because uh, as I said, to be able to speak about that thing categorically, you need more machinery. You have to say that the category is closed. And this means that if your category is closed, then I would say, oh, that's just a type, which is the case for type theories usually. But the point is that in general, uh, let me give you this example. Uh, suppose I have two topological spaces, okay? And I have continuous functions between them. Yes. Um, I don't know if this is the right example, but uh, maybe just the category of sets would be enough. And no, because say, I, I'm trying to find the non-closed category. That's exactly the point. So I don't know if Wolfram is getting stuck on that. It is top it's in the composite of two functions, right? But yeah, but like is top closed? No. Okay, so the idea is that if I have two topological spaces and I have continuous functions between them, the set of continuous functions between these topological spaces is not itself a topological space. Indeed. Indeed. I mean, so that, that, but I don't understand. If you just talk about integers, the set of functions between integers is not itself an integer. Exactly, it's not itself an integer, but if you are looking at it from the point of view of sets, then it is a set. You can always say that functions- okay, Let me understand that. Let me understand what you're saying. So if I say integers map to integers, right? Yes. Then, then that mapping in, its, in and of itself is not an integer. I mean, of course you could girdle number it and then it would be an integer, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So I don't know how that relates to anything, but um, you know, assuming you're not doing computation theory, um, mm -hmm. then that thing is an integer. But now if you say this is a mapping from sets to sets. Then you then have a way to speak about that object. Uh, you can even do int to int. The point is your context. If those int are represent, if you're working in the category of sets, then you can say int is a set, int is a set, and the set of all functions between them is a set. So the point is that within the category of set, you have a way to represent that arrow as an object. While sure. if your category is not the category of set, that arrow may not represent anything in right. your category. So, so, so if we believe that the universe is computational, we essentially have a category in which we can represent everything. That is, if, if everything is a, you know, both the transformations and the objects can be represented computationally. Mm -hmm. I mean, in other words, even in this yes. case here, we could, I mean, basically with Gödel numbering, we could represent that function from integers to integers as itself an integer. Yes, the, the point of Gödel numbering and the reason why this wouldn't precisely work in category theory is that um, these properties are always defined category theoretically as universal. So you want to say that there is one and only one way to do things. Like category theory works up to 
canonical kind of stuff. And the Gödel numbering is not canonical. You you can choose to do the Gödel numbering in another way. Um, and so you I'm, I'm a little confused by that because you, in, in the case of sets, the the kind of the representation of a set, your claim is that that sort of as soon as I'm saying it's a set that obeys the axioms of set theory, then there's only one way to represent this collection of things as a set. Is that the claim? Uh, up to isomorphism. Okay. All right. So you can relabel the elements and things like that, but there's... But and you will always have a bijection between uh, your representations. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, by the way, I did notice that we had Matthew on this. Uh, Matthew's still here. Does he want to make some comment about um, uh, the how this relates to... Um, uh, uh, because he's thought about all kinds of, of numbering and pairing functions and so on. Is Matthew here? Are you able to make a comment? Maybe not. They, um, okay. All right. So, so um, I, I, I am here, Stephen. Okay. Did you want to make a comment on, on the statement that there's no canonical pairing function, which is basically what Fabrizio just said? Um, no, no, I, I actually do not want to make a statement. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Okay, but, but so I'm understanding that the, this notion of a closed category is something where all the things that you're operating on and this whole, uh, these mappings are themselves representable in the category. Is that correct? Precisely. Correct? So in, in arbitrary, like in general, in category theory, you can always say, I consider the set of morphisms between two objects. If your category is, uh, as an, it's called an internal uh, home object or closed, then you can actually say there is an object within my category that represents this set. Okay, so you're saying that the main thing is there's a set of morphisms between objects. And the question is, um, can you represent, can you represent those morphisms in that set? Can you represent that set as itself a member of the category? Exactly. So uh, an example of this would be vector spaces because uh, linear applications between two vector spaces form themselves a vector space. Okay, but so wait a minute. That, that's, that is saying vector spaces with particular operations, mapping vector spaces to vector spaces, right? Um, what I'm saying is your category is vector spaces as objects Yes. and linear functions as morphisms between them. This is okay, your and So you're saying those linear functions can themselves be represented as vector spaces. That's yeah, right. you can always endow them with uh, a notion of, with a vector space structure in a quite canonical way, because you can say uh, the sum of these functions is defined by doing the sum pointwise in the target vector space. So just to understand my, my world of transformations between symbolic expressions. So in my world, you know, expers, expressions, are, have some structure. They are, they are objects. And yeah. you can think of them as being in some category. Now, meanwhile, the transformations between symbolic expressions are themselves symbolic expressions. So I can yes. have, you know, f of g of whatever. So... Um, uh, so your category will be most likely closed, or if you want to categorify this, you want to aim to have a closed category as your standard definition. Right, okay, so, so this is an expression, and this transformation rule is also an expression. Yes, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So what? Okay, so I have these categories. Some of them are closed. Some of them are not closed. You're saying the interesting ones tend to be closed. Is that true? Uh, no, not necessarily. There are like, uh, for instance, uh, being closed when you do topological kind of stuff, uh, geometric kind of stuff is not that common. Um, but because, what is... but that, that's the statement that in mathematics, the, I mean, you know, in a symbolic language, functions, uh, you know, programs and data are the same kind of thing. I mean, you're saying being closed is basically a programs and data are the same kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, that's that's why this is at the heart of the at the heart of the Curry Howard uh, Lambeck isomorphism. Yes, precisely. Okay, is is because yeah, you you can always uh, consider 
like all the programs that carry you from A to B as a data a piece of data and and yeah there is this correspondence okay all right so that, that's the notion of a closed category so so in the in the case of for example graphs just to do the exercise when yes. you're talking about mapping between graphs that mapping is probably itself represented as a graph right uh, graph should be closed. Uh, maybe Matteo can correct me right. if I'm wrong. Topos, so it's very, very good as a category. Yes, okay. okay yes, so, so it's closed. So, so for graphs, when you say we have a mapping between graphs, we're saying basically we've got a graph, one of those graphs ahead above, got another graph, and the mapping between graphs takes vertices to vertices, for example. Yes. And that itself can be represented as a graph, just saying vertex A in the first graph goes to vertex two in the second graph. Yes, right? basically. Uh, I, I didn't work out the details, but yeah, the idea is that there is another graph that, let's say, faithfully represents this mapping between graphs. Yes. Right. Okay. So, so in... All right. Actually, not a graph. Uh, let me think about it. It uh, depends what kind of mapping you have. If you're saying, that, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I was I was saying that the graph representing a mapping within gra between graphs is the graph you get by like uh, first multiplying the two graphs together, so that now you have vertices which are pairs of vertices mm -hmm. where the first one is the it's a vertex from the first graph and the second one is a vertex from the second graph and and so on and then you link stuff that gets sent to stuff so it's it's very intuitive actually okay okay that's the same <laughs> mm -hmm. well i'm, I'm not complete I, I i can see that there's a way of i mean okay it's within reach to say that what this graph category is closed. It's obviously not within reach. You're telling me it's not within reach to say that the integer category, the category of inter integers and functions on integers is closed because you're not allowing Gödel numbering for reasons I, I more or less understand. Mm -hmm. So yes. in other words, the, the um, I mean, you know, programs equals data is clearly much more general than the things you normally think of as being data that represents programs, but we're not, we're not allowing that. Okay. So now I think I understand, I hope I understand. So we've got the category of category of, of some kind of thing, and we've got certain morphisms, which are mappings from between objects in this category. Mm -hmm. Correct yes. statement? Okay. Correct statement. And okay. I, I think that the, the most important thing that um, needs to be said is that uh, the same kind of thing can be categorified in different ways. The real question uh, we should ask is, if I want to study, for instance, groups, what is the relevant kind of transformation between these groups? What, what group-like properties we want to preserve? This gives us a notion of morphism and this gives us a definition of category. But then the idea is that, I, that there are examples of of categories um, that have actually the same objects. One, uh, one example, for instance, is topological spaces. I can uh, say that I have a category where my objects are topological spaces and my morphisms are continuous functions. But I could also say, no, actually, my objects are topological spaces, but my functions are homotopy equivalent, uh, equivalent classes of continuous functions. So I'm considering deformations up to homotopy. And this will give me two very different categories, even if the objects are the same. And the reason is that I'm focusing on different kinds of transformations. So that's the real power of category theory, is being able to say, to isolate the kind of property you care about. So for instance, each group is trivially also a set, you know, just like you throw away the group operations and the, the underlying thing uh, to the group is a set. And a group homomorphism is always a function between sets. So you can also say that, well, actually, I can, I can see groups as a subcategory of sets and, and study them there. But in doing that, obviously, you are losing the group-like properties. So 
the whole point of category theory is basically this is to being able to find the right definitions that you know represent the things you care about and in fact in our work is like 80 percent of the time you you use it just to define things and 20 percent of the time you use it to prove things because when your definitions are the right ones the proofs they all just follow because you know they basically follow canonically from the definition is is actually quite rare to to have a really hard right uh, that's why that's why people don't use i mean people have written category theory packages for mathematica but they are mostly structural it's not like you're doing it's not like traditionally in my understanding at least that in category theory that you're doing you know non trivial crunchy computations to figure things out is that a fair statement non trivial sorry uh, crunchy computations that that once you know your statement is once you can write the thing in the formalism once you can write something down in the formalism everything is sort of obvious yes basically that's i think that's the whole purpose of category theory yes okay so i would claim that that right there is telling you that there's a great depth because you know basically you're saying there's there's nothing computationally irreducible that ever gets done in category theory everything is on the surface of things that are essentially structural and that means yes, probably yes and and even more importantly the more you study category theory the more you see that um everything is everything else like <laughs> this is yes. a famous statement in category theory basically the in, in category theory all the categorical tools we develop are uh, amount just to reframe the same stuff under a different point of view and so in the end you say okay i have a set what is a set where well, it's a set and it's a category and is also a noun functor and is also an internal object and you say what and, and that's what is super confusing especially in the beginning that literally everything is everything else so you say i, I don't know, like i define limits which are an important categorical ob concept and then you say well actually limits are adjunctions and actually adjunctions are limits and and people you know they they start freaking out saying no that you know it feels like nothing is ever fixed but the point is that every time you're just developing a new point pretty much everything you already did up to that point okay so so let's let's try to take let, let's take a couple of examples let's talk about groups for a second mm -hmm. okay. so yes groups have elements they can be defined in terms of you know they have the elements can be represented as products of generators but there are yes. different choices of generators that you can make for a group still maintaining the particular relations you know and with different generators you have different relations but it's mm -hmm. still the same group uh, as you can determine by looking at homomorphisms between between these groups yes so how do how do i think about that in other words in category theory if i want to have a particular group the group a4 or something right if i have that particular group is that something that i talk about in category theory or do i only talk about the set of all groups you can do it um so there are two main ways to think about groups in category theory the first thing is um a group is itself a category and you can see uh, a group as a category with only one object and each morphism is a basically a loop arrow on on this object and each one of these morphism represents a group element and then basically you require that for each one of these arrows there is also an inverse that goes the other way around and that composed with it gives you the identity i don't Why know if... okay naive question why isn't the scaly graph a thing that represents that that corresponds what why can't i think of these things as objects these are elements of the group right and these these arrows that correspond to the you know multiplication by generators why can't those be thought of as morphisms uh arrow correspond to multiplication of generators well um you have to define composition though well you do define composition composition is you multiply by this generator then you multiply by this generator and you get from that element to that element yeah but you don't have a narrow between those two elements so so you're so saying you're if saying i took this graph, graph and i said the transitive closure yes 
So if I take that graph and I make the very, very messy transitive closure graph. Perfect. Yes. Then what the heck am I doing here? I mean, this is, this is saying, so from any element by the structure of the group, I can get to any other element because by definition, by multiplying by enough mm -hmm. generators, I can get to any other element, can't I? Yes, that should be correct, yes. Right, so this is a complete graph here. Okay. Although the particular sequence of generators that I need to multiply by to get, I mean, you know, the word problem is, is like, you know, is there a particular sequence of generators yes. that takes me from here to there? And that will give you different arrows in, in that thing. Right, but so, so in what sense, I mean, just to understand, is this like, is there anything, can category theory say anything useful about what I just constructed? Or is this just a sort of degenerate case of something that one might think about in category theory? Uh, I don't think in this case, I mean, on the nose, you can say anything particularly useful, but um, again, like the point is always coming up with a clever definition. Like usually if you can not say something useful, it's because we didn't define the category in the right way. It's actually okay. very difficult to come up with uh, meaningful examples on on the spot that can, you know. Okay, let's let's talk about a case that I, you know, the Curry Howard business, because you know okay. we have. So, for example, in in our language, we would have something where we can make a proof, right? So we've mm -hmm. got, I don't know. Well, let's let's do this. Let's do a very simple case. What's a good example? Let's pull up a random. Actually, I might have an example here. Um, uh, let's see. Let's so oh, yeah. Let's do let's do group group theory. Okay. So this is this would be the axioms of group theory. Okay. So I've got. So I don't know how we think about this categorically, but I could say perfectly well. Um, you know, I could say there's. So so maybe you can explain to me. So th this now would be a representation of a proof in. So this is this is a representation of group theory. This is a representation of a proof in group theory. So okay. mm -hmm. is there a way of understanding? So so one thing I can think about is each one of these of these pieces here. Well, maybe Jonathan, who wrote this code. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, the Curry Howard isomorphism in the context of fine equational proof is just stating that every proof has an associated proof function and every proof function can be interpreted as a proof. So if you call find equational proof, but instead of requesting the proof graph, you get a proof function, you get a symbolic piece of from language code that we can run. Okay, so let's take a look at this. I'm trying to understand this. Okay, so there's okay. a proof function. So then you can run that. What, what happens if I run it? Do I just say- It should just I say it? true. I just apply it to nothing. Yep. That wasn't right. a very exciting function. It's a pretty exciting function because it verifies that, that proof was actually correct. Yep. Um, so, but, so my point is, my point is the okay. The, the, the direct find equational proof interpretation of the Curry-Howard isomorphism is that every symbolic proof has an associated proof function, and that, and moreover, the more surprising direction that every symbolic piece of Wolfram language code can has a interpretation as a proof as a, as a proof object. Is it the code itself, or is it the execution of the code somehow? No, it's the code itself. So you're saying I, I could imagine something where. Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is where I get really confused. So let, let's say I write down something like this. What is its associated proof object? I mean, that thing just sits there. Right. So, so in, the, in that case, you can, you can treat that as being a proof that that particular, the associated computation holds. That's a trivial interpretation of it. The evaluation f of g of x, y, comma, z, is a, it, that evaluation terminates. And that expression mm -hmm. that you just output is, is the proof of that that is true. So, so if I type in something like this, let's say I type two to the two plus three to the four. Okay, well, let me type, do something less trivial. Um, divided by, oh, I don't know, times one plus six times seven. Okay, so that trace will show me the sequence of operations that took place to get to the result. Is that mm -hmm. relevant to anything? Should I think of that as, I mean, is that the, is that what you mean by? Yeah, that, so, that, so those would be, you know, you could interpret those as being intermediate steps 
I, you know, each one of those is, it can be treated as, in the, again, in the language of fine equational proof, each one of those could be treated as the statement of a substitution lemma with the particular symbolic transformation from one to the other being the application of a rewrite operation. And so, so that is a sequence of, substitu of, of substitution lemmas that constitutes the proof that that particular evaluation terminated. Okay, so what is the Curry-Howard statement about all of this? Like I said, I mean, it, it, in the, Fabrizio probably has a more general interpret. I mean, that there's, there are all kinds of formulations in terms of dependent type theory and so on, but the, mm -hmm. the direct fine equational proof formulation is exactly that, that, that every proof object has an associated proof function and that every piece of code can be interpreted as a proof object. Every piece of code can be interpreted as a proof object. So that proof is the proof that, so wait a minute, the, every piece of code, the proof, wait a minute, every piece of code will have an input and it'll have an output. I say two plus six and it will, whoops, I do it if it was an input cell, I could say something like two plus two and it will come out as four. So are you saying that when you say a piece of code, you mean the code two plus two has yes. the sort of proof two plus two is four. Is that right? Right, right. Okay, so then you're saying in, in the language of sort of some category theory thing, you might be saying two plus two is transformed to four somehow. Is that right? Is that, is that, um, is there a-, there, a The of... reason why it's difficult to understand these ways because you are thinking about terms without thinking about types. So- Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so thinking in terms of like a typed programming language would be much, I think much clearer. Yes. Okay, so Tally, can you give an example? I mean, I'm not claiming to be partic a particular, um, but so mine, and I think there are different ways of looking at it, but my understanding is that if you can kind of compile and run a program, then the, the fact that you're able to do that is sort of like a witness to the types making sense. Um, and that corresponds in a way to a proof about the types. Is that roughly right, guys? I'm not an expert, but that was my intuition for it. Well, so, so if, you, if you're proving some, some arbitrary theorem, the statement is that the proof of that theorem is equivalent to the statement that the execution of a program yields a result of a particular type. And Correct. so in the case, yeah. in the case of, a, if, of a proof function here, that's why, uh, why I gave the example of a proof function. You can think of this as, you know, the, the, the possible outcomes of a proof function have two types, so to speak, even though they're not technically yeah, so types, which are true and false. Let's say that if you want to prove a theorem, okay, so you, 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 you say basically what you have is a statement that says uh, type of hypothesis implies type of thesis. And the idea is that basically this implication is telling you that as soon as you can produce something of type hypothesis, then you can produce something of type thesis. And Curry Hour saying that this corresponds to a function or a, pro a functional program that goes from hypothesis to thesis. And now hypothesis and thesis correspond to data structures, basically. So, yeah. But So this is very abstract way of putting it. Maybe we could say something like, um, you can embed uh, a sort of proof in a program in a particular way, such that if you're able to run the program, you've kind of verified the proof. Is that correct? Or is that not right? Well, I mean, because of the carry hour correspondence, yeah, if you have a program that proves something and that compiles, then you can say that that is a proof as long as you know your the, correspondence yeah, is correct that we need to understand is that when you are speaking about proving in this context, it's kind of a different way from the standard way of proving things. That is, maybe we learn how to prove things in the classical way, but the Kari Howard isomorphism really works when you're reasoning in a constructive way. So that proving something means to construct a witness of the truth of that statement. Right, right so you, exactly. You, you're exactly demonstrating that a particular type is that. inhabited. But in this particular case, yes. okay, if, if, you, if, you, if you interpret true and true false as being elementary types, types it, it, with respect it, to this proof function, the function yeah. then, the outcome, then the, outcome. the outcome of this proof function is exactly demonstrating that a particular type, in this case true, is, is inhabited. Yes. yes, exactly. But you can have even more complex like of course. proof types. Yeah. Right, and but we're, we're, we're held back by the fact that we don't have uh, you know, a, a natural type yeah. theoretic structure in the Wolfram language. <laughs> Something like the, the trace function and some the, the thing you 
it's well, printed out to under four. That's something actually really close to this Curry Howard way of thinking because also something that's, that is really integral to this interpretation is the concept of normalization of terms. So the computation is really normalization of terms, which means that like from a logical standpoint, you have terms which are like syntactical expressions and you want to show that two things are equal, like that your long statement of the theorem is equal to true, for example. And the way you do this is to actually construct a proof tree like with syntactical rules. And these things are actually what is called a normalization of this term. Right, which, so which is which, which is worth saying is exactly how find equational proof works internally. So, so, so yeah. what it's doing is it's taking some arbitrary abstract rewriting system, it's applying a Knuth-Bendix completion procedure to it, and then it's just as uh, and, and then it's applying those completed rules to the left and right hand sides of the input expression, you know, ad infinitum until the, until both sides terminated a normal form, and then it, it does the trivial kind of test of equivalence between the normal forms. Yes, can I understand? You know, it'd be so helpful. Good. What would be so helpful for me, and maybe Stephen, you're in the same boat, is like. Just a real simple example <laughs> that would illustrate this correspondence in action. Like, you know, this um, this function from integers, from two, an argument of a list of integers and an integer to this other thing. Like the fact that you can compile and run this um, and you can find an inhabitant of that type is, an, is a exercise of the proof or ver verification of a proof about something else. Just like one example would be really helpful because in a way the abstraction is not that interesting to me unless it can kind of like be grounded in an intuitive example. Why is the proof function example not, not a reasonable example in that case? Well, let's have a simpler version of that. Can we have a really simple version of that? So we can well, you can just understand? do, you can do like find equational proof A equals C from like A equals B, B equals C. Okay, find That's equational proof of what? Case. Uh, like A equals equals C. Yep. Given the list A equals equals B, B equals equals C. It's the simplest example I can think of. Okay. And then what I say, I want what I want for that is the proof function for that. Yes. What the heck is all that stuff? <laughs> so, so ignore the variables. Those are kind of ugly, right? So we're starting from axioms one and two. So we have A equals B, B equals C. And we have a hypothesis, A equals C. And then we're doing a map out, replace B goes to A. Can you, can you slow down a bit? Sorry. Thanks. Okay, sorry. Um, so we have two axioms, A equals B, B equals C, that are represented there. Those are the first two lines, right? And we have the hypothesis, okay. the thing that we're trying to prove, which is A equals C. And then to so do this is a function of no arguments, just, just before we get to that. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, all, all, all proof functions are completely argument free. Okay. Um, and then the hypo I mean, you you could treat the hypothesis as being an argument if you wanted to, but it's just that's not how we represent it. Um, can you can you orient well, can you orient how we're supposed to interpret this function? Like, what what are you leading us towards in understanding this particular function? So okay, so if you if you take the proof object here and you you request its data, if you request the proof data set. Okay. So here. Okay, so here's a data set representation of that proof. So, again, so here you can see we're starting from those two axioms, A equals B, B equals C, trying to prove this hypothesis that A equals C. So then there's only one non-trivial step here, which is that you, you have to, I say non-trivial in, in, in a generalized sense. So to, to deduce the A equals C, you take the input of axiom two, and at position one, you apply axiom one, which, and then if you expand out that, that little proof there, Stephen, um, then you can see that, that, that Axiom one in orientation one, which means left to right, becomes the replacement operation B goes to A, because the axiom one was B equals equals A. And so then you get the output. So after applying that transformation, you get the output expression A equals equals C. The point of the proof function is you don't have to take find equational proofs word for it if you don't want to. You can just, you can actually, rep you can represent that purely in terms of map at replace operations. And, and then just run the proof and see that you do indeed get a uh, tautology. Oh, so let me just frame this in, in a certain way. So what this is trying to prove, this is trying to say that you can deduce A equals C just by using these axioms, that there exists a purely substitutional way of getting A equals C by just substituting with these axioms. You don't have to do any, you don't have to know Fermat's last theorem, you don't have to know anything like that. All you have to know is structurally how to replace one thing by another. 
right? Uh, not only replacement in the, but yeah, mainly yes. But in the context of uh, career award, you are also allowed to do things like taking pairs and other very elementary constructive kind of things. But yeah, you are basically. Well, right. so by constructive, you mean, okay. So to my mind, what you're doing is you're literalizing pattern variables. You know, you're taking something which would be a pattern variable, a, um, you know, a, a bound variable some, in some lambda or something like that, or a pattern variable in our world. And you're saying you're, you're turning, you're saying that pattern variable is now equal to such and such a particular thing. That's one what? operation you're doing. And you're doing the purely, so that's sort of a substitution operation. Now, what other operations are you, are you allowed to do? You're allowed to do all the operations of the lambda calculus, basically. So like uh, okay. taking pairs of two, two objects. Uh, so if you have X and Y, you can consider a pairing of X and Y. Um, by, by pairing, you mean lambda X, lambda Y. What, what do you mean by pairing? I mean, like parentheses Apple. X comma Y parentheses, yes. How do you construct that? Over you mean the data structure like a tuple or? Yes, what taking tuples as a data structure, yes. But, but how do you do that with lambdas? So are you doing that with lambdas by saying something like this? If, if I write, if... if um, Again, we are using typed lambda calculus. In untyped lambda calculus, it would basically be yes. What, what, well, what is it? What is it? What exactly is it? So an untyped lambda calculus, you would have, how, how do you make, okay, this is a Matthew question if for nobody else. How do you make tuples in, the, in lambda calculus? I don't think you can, actually. Because in... Um. Matthew? There are actually many ways to make uh, tuples in lambda calculus. One, what is one of them? Um, uh, the, the basic idea in untyped lambda calculus is you, you simply use a function um, that takes an input that, that basically chooses between two different things. So, so, so the function then Count, count, it, it, it's basically the idea of like a conditional. So you have something like a conditional and then you feed it an input, the input chooses between one of those two things. So you can think of that conditional expression as, as being a tuple. Wow, what, but so, so it's not purely structural. It actually has to compute something. Well, yeah, it, because it, in lambda calculus, it, uh, it, right, in lambda calculus, calculus, everything is a function. So the tuple is a function. Yes, what, because why, in why, Sorry, go on. In lambda calculus, you only have one type, right? So obviously, like if you if you take tuples, the tuples will have to be of that type, and so yeah, you can create it in in this way. But the the reason why I say there isn't a real way to do so is because uh, it, it doesn't even make much sense to consider them. I think in untyped lambda calculus, like in type lambda calculus, everything has a type, and so. The idea is that if I have something of type A and something of type B, I want to be able to consider A something, you know, their pairing as having type A times B. But if that's, everything has That's a specific type constructor of making tuples like that, right? Yes. You have exactly. to have that. I mean, that's for each, just the base types. You need to have this for each possible couple of types, yes. That you have right. a so, way. so in, but, in a type, con, you know, in... Type, you know, construction of type in the typed lambda calculus, you both mm -hmm. have the idea that a particular lambda of one type can return a lambda of some other type. And you have this idea of making tuples. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Do you have any other ideas? I mean, that yeah, is. Yeah, you thing. also require two basic types, which are uh, the unit type, uh, which is the type with only one term in it, basically, the type true. And I think you also require to have the type. Um, false, which is the type that is not inhabited, that has, has, doesn't have anything into it. Wait a minute. When you say the type true is inhabited, you're saying that that type is just that something exists there. Is that right? Is that is that what the the type is just a type that says this is an inhabited type, as in something exists of this type. Is that right? Yeah, the, 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 the type true has exactly one term that is true, that basically means the truth. And there is no other way to, like, it, it's a type with only one thing in it. Okay. 
Um, right, by the okay. way, so, sorry, ju ju um, just about your previous question. Isn't the, the Cartesian product in lambda calculus, isn't it just lambda AB function dot function AB? Lambda AB function dot function. Uh, yes, what? I presume, yes. Possibly. Yeah, I, Can you translate that into Wolfram language? I don't know what the dot, what is the, what would that be? Function? The, just the dot in lambda calculus, I mean. You mean, which is just the, the I mean, the dot is the syntactic form that, that, you know, separates the bound variables from the body. Right, right, exactly. Okay, but so, so what is that in our case? Is it, is, are you saying that the thing would be function of X, function of Y, what? Some constant. That that's a representation of, I don't understand this. I don't understand. That's got two uh, bound variables, but only one body. And in lambda calculus, that would be lambda, um, lambda A, lambda B, dot what i mean yeah the point is that the pair doesn't really make sense if you don't give <laughs> a way to extract the two components of the pair so usually lambda right. calculus you find a way to encode the pair that i think is pretty much similar to what jonathan suggested yes. and then and the two projections and then to access the first or the second term of the pair you use the projections yeah you can't can't you just do like lambda pair dot pair of lambda a b dot whatever dot whichever one you want you mean you have a, a, an explicit function mm -hmm. i'm confused anyway i don't think this matters I, how, did i work this out wrong i i'm pretty sure that's hang on let me give me a second but, but, but i'm pretty sure that's the cartesian product okay. just to just to kind of get some flow here i mean i think one of the things i mean we thought we'd figured out a little bit about how our physics models might relate to category theory but i think we're still here worrying about, you know, getting a framing of what, how you guys think about category theory, how one should think about category theory. Um, and that, um, uh, which I think is still challenging. Can I, go ahead. Can I, can I present, so this is from someone who's not really like a practicing, I mean, I'm interested in category theory and I've learned a little bit of, about it, but my kind of sense of what the value of category theory is not so much in, in producing any kind of particular calculational result or sort of like tell you something deep and, and interesting about a subject that a very detailed area of mathematics that you already knew well. It was rather the kind of like the sort of setting to notice and understand that a lot of the kinds of processes that go on in one area of mathematics are the same kind of processes that go on in yes. other areas of mathematics if you choose the right abstractions. So in other words, there's sort of like metaphorical things going on all over different areas of math that when set in the right language are identical. And that's not just that they like like each other, but there's a very precise sense in which they're the same. Um, and Sorry. category theory brings out that latent structure that is there everywhere. And so it's a sense, in, it's, in a sense, it's an abstraction. It's a kind of like effort to bring, uh, formalize sort of abstract procedures that are being used in different places and kind of bring them to a, a, create a common language to understand them and think about them and point out in all the different areas where they happen. And there might be many ways that you could do that. So one is that like you can talk in a way that people will know what you mean. You, you can talk about this abstract procedure like a co-limit or something. People will know what that is independent of the particular instantiation of that in an area of mathematics. So that's one yes. thing that you can do with category theory. Another thing that you can do is that you can be inspired to try new things in a particular area because they're kind of like natural things to try when you've been educated in all the sort of categorical tricks that people use in different areas. So it's a kind of tool for thought. It's a frame to look at different areas of mathematics, to unify mm -hmm. certain parts of them, to think precisely about structure, algebraic structures and other structures. And so in that, in that sense, it's, it's like, a, it's not quite, it might not have its own content really, or it does, but it's really about abstraction for its own sake. Um, and, that can be so, valuable, right? Let me, I, I, that's okay. so my understanding. I mean, you know, to give an analogy, in the original invention of logic, that could be thought of in the same kind of way. People had all these different arguments about, you know, this could be followed from this and so on and so on and so on. And then Aristotle and friends invented essentially this formula, formula making all these different, all these different specific, specific kinds of arguments about, you know, going to war or eating different foods or something and said all these kinds of arguments fit into this pattern 
that corresponds to, let's say, syllogistic logic or something. Mm -hmm. and, and what you're saying is that, say, there's, a, there's an analogous thing that you're doing for forms of argument or structures of, of construction yeah. in mathematics. Is that a fair? Yeah, like products. Like, what is a product? I mean, it's a very general thing. And, but it, it turns out like there are all kinds of different products that you'd find in different places, whether it's products of sets yes. or of you know, functions or uh, vector spaces or whatever. But actually, if you see them in a categorical sense, they're all the same. Always thing. the same. Yeah, and that's they have what a very particular about. structure. Okay. So but, uh, can I, I can give you a very simple example of how this works. Like, uh, yeah, you can basically do the products of sets, of topological spaces, of groups, of whatever you want. And every time you have to define a way to do it. But if you want to abstract, you know, what, what is the, the real idea behind a product? The, the essence real idea, of a product. It, the essence of a product is that if you give me two objects of any sort, the product should have first a couple of projection functions. So I should be able to go from the products to the two components in some way. And the second, essence is that if I give you a function to the first component and a function to the second component, then there should be exactly one unique way to take these two things and to go to the product, which is what we usually do in set theory by saying we define these things component wise. So, you know, we say F product G is defined on X as f of x, g of x. But uh, in the essence, basically, is um, that I can take these things and package them all together into a diagram that I will show you in a second. Just a time to, to write it. F, g. And by the way, that is a, that's a universal phenomenon that like a lot of the stuff a lot of the kind of like mental work yes. is just looking at diagrams and saying okay. this diagram commutes. But that's Can you see this? Yes. So the idea is that if you give me A and B, the product should be an A times B thing so that I have these two projections. And more importantly, every time I give you an F and a G from some C, there is exactly a unique way to lift this to the product. And we do this by components, basically, component-wise, in right. groups or in sets, for instance. But this is this thing is packaged categorically in the notion of limit. And at that point, I'm able to, to say, I have a unique tool, and I am able to say, oh, actually, this very weird construction in this super weird category is exactly the right notion of the pro of product in this context because it it satisfies this diagram. So in this sense, now I'm able to link a very complicated thing in some category with a very simple thing like product of sets by saying these are exactly the same thing in these two different contexts. All right. Okay. So let's take an example here that that would be. In, okay, there are two different approaches that I can imagine in our uh, world of, of thinking about physics and so on. So, um, sorry, but just before you get on to that, can I, can I just state a, a, a slight disagreement with the idea that I think that category theory is kind of purely bureaucratic from the point of view of our project? There are at least five areas where I think it might actually have significant things, like non trivial things to say about the nature of our formula. That's world. a lot but, of areas. Right. Um, Okay, but I mean, so, so the non-bureaucratic aspect of category theory is the mechanics of these diagrams and so on. Is that correct? It's things you do with these diagrams. That are, I mean, what, what's the non-bureaucratic aspect of category theory? The non-bureaucratic aspect of category theory is that I can define things in a category, I can distill it to abstract things, and then I can transfer them over to other categories. I think that's the, the most uh, important thing because right. like, so, imagine so, that I have a category that has products and the definition of products is plainly awful. It's something horrendous you would never ever think about in your life. I would never go looking for this thing and discover that maybe it's valuable in some way if I didn't have this abstract definition of product first. 
If I... right, so, so for example, Jonathan, I mean, you, you know, the fact that we are looking for things like black holes in branchial space, yes. where, you know, it starts off being looking at black holes in physical space, but we have a essentially mathematical structure for branchial space that's similar to our one for physical space. So the obvious question is what's an event horizon in branchial space? Those, is that the right. kind of thing you're... Well, I mean, that's, yeah, it's a very simple, straightforward example of an obvious lifting from the concept of a space-time causal graph to the concept of a multi-way causal graph. But so, for instance, what, one very general thing that I was interested in asking Fabrizio about was, um, the, you know, the, the, so, okay, one, of, one general problem that we have in, in, that we've encountered many, many times in the, in the study of these formalisms is the notion of going between uh, sort of representations and reality, so to speak, right? So if you have, uh, if you take a space-time causal graph, uh, you know, our our idea is that it represents some. It rep it's a representation. It's a, it's a skeletonized uh, version of the conformal structure of some Lorentzian manifold. It, it, you know, in the idealized case. Um, now, category theory has developed this whole machinery of the tanaka krein duality Tanakian formalism. That this sort of, which is this generalized way of, of you know t using the enriched Yoneda lemma to to go from you know representations of an object to the object itself and back again. And you know, so one question that I think is obviously worth posing is: Is there a possibility that we can make use of a, of a, sort of a kind of Tanaki formalism to translate between things like the space-time causal graph and Lorentzian manifolds? And if we can, then as you as you correctly say, that will immediately give us insight into what the continuum limit of something like the multi-way causal graph would be. I may be wrong, but what, didn't Roger Penrose already work? out something like this uh, in the 70s? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. So, so, the, so the, the Penrose's differential topo uh, topological techniques that he developed for, for studying Lorentzian manifolds, the, a combinatorial representation of those of, of that structure okay. is exactly what the causal network is. So, so, so Pe Penrose's differential topology methods give you the notion of causal precedence, chronological precedence, and horismus for any space-time event. It turns out, you know, each of those is just a partial order. You can construct the, the exactly. transfer reduction so of the, can, the Hasse you, diagram you, for that, and you get a yeah. network. And and so, yes. so, but then, so then, there's in differential topology. There's a there's a sort of there's a technique which allows you to go from that combinatorial structure to the actual Lorentzian manifold and back mm -hmm. again. And and okay. so, what one obvious question is: Can we represent that in some uh, as some Tanakian duality? And if so, can we generalize it to these higher well, order? Well, the objects? the right way to do it categorically, I think, would be uh, that, uh, as you said, um, Penrose basically gives you a poset for each manifold, and so you are basically. I think you you get a functor that goes from the category of space times differential manifolds, whatever you represent these things, to the category of posets. What you want is a category that is actually more structured than a category of posets because you want to also encode some combinatorial information of some sort. Uh, you want to make sure that all you care about from your combinatorial point of view is represented in this category in the right way. And then what you want to prove is that you have an adjunction between the category in which you represent the space times and the category in which these manifolds, uh, these, these combinatorial structures leave. And if you have an, an adjunction, that basically means that, yeah, you can go back and forth um, in, in any way you want, basically. Um, yeah, it is. So, it's a, that, that's an interesting point, and it was partly why I asked about the junctions earlier. So, I, I'm, I'm aware that in some of the stuff you've done with, with Petri nets, right? Yes. That, that the fact that you get an adjunction between, say, a Petri net and a, and a you know, symmetric monoidal category, that actually yeah. harms you in some ways, right? That, 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 that removes some, some nice categories of the Petri net representation. Uh, well, uh, I mean, the, the problem there is a bit more delicate, and it's mainly that. A patronet doesn't, in a patronet, a transition doesn't really distinguish uh, it, the order of inputs, you know, because transitions are defined as having inputs and outputs as multisets. So the idea is that if a transition takes a token from A and a token from B, or a token from B and a token from A, is the exact same thing. Is is a graph you you can permute the places and nothing happens. While in a symmetric model category, actually your morphisms um, distinguish between possible orders uh, of tokens. So, you know, you have to say, actually this morphism takes a token from A and a token from B. And this is different than saying token from B and tokens from A. In, in practice, what I'm trying to say is that patronets are defined using multisets, which are unordered lists, while um, 
symmetric model categories are defined by uh, using lists, strings of, of things which are ordered. And so uh, a lot of people have tried to prove a correspondence between these two things because it really feels like uh, the Petronet presents the SMC in some way. But because you have this difference that in one case things are not ordered and the other one uh, they are, you basically need to do a lot of weird stuff to make it work. And by saying, by to make it work, I mean finding an adjunction. Um, and the reason, yeah, this actually harms you when, when you look at the practice, uh, at implementation and stuff. But that's because you are trying to get an junction between two things that look like very similar, but they are actually not similar enough so that this adjunction does something nice that, that you want. Uh, by the way, we fixed this problem. I'm in the process of uh, writing a paper with uh, John Baez, Jade Master, and Mike Schulman about this. So we found a more, let's say, relaxed version of Petronet, more general version of Petronet that as an adjunction with symmetric model categories uh, that works well. And it also has adjunctions with all the other flavors of patronets that have been considered in the literature. So we basically found this missing piece that makes now everything consistent and working in the right way. So this program, by the way, will, will I mean, I think we'll publish this thing in a few months, but. Oh, cool. And, and so, so the, category, so the categories don't have to be strict. Uh, yes, usually, again, uh, in, in, in the pattern literature, all this stuff, the category is always strict. Okay. Uh, the reason why they are always strict is because you really don't want to, I mean, concurrency doesn't, you know, doesn't have any order. If I say transition T, U, and V fire at the same time, it doesn't make any sense to say, U and V fire and then W fires or you know vice versa. So in this sense, yeah, right. you want strictness uh, to represent concurrency. That that's I think is probably the only undisputed point at the <laughs> moment in the whole Petronet literature uh, category theory applied to Petronet literature. Oh, the hold on, let, let's is, just talk about Petronets for a sec. Sorry, Jonathan, go yeah. ahead. I was going to say, sorry, but this is one of the things that, that does actually concern me about, about this, because I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about using some kind of Tanakian formalism to go from our representations to the actual geometric stru geometrical structures that they're supposed to represent. One of the things that does concern me is, so for instance, at a trivial level, you know, our hypergraph models are, they are unordered lists of ordered lists. Yes. They, they suffer from exactly the problem that your Petrinet formalism does. And so it does concern me a little bit. If, if we define, say, an adjunction between the hypergraph and some Riemannian manifold, whether in exactly the same way as you do in the Petrinet case, whether you're actually going to be losing some information in doing that. And that the, you know, the, the, the thing we think is the object that it's representing, like a Riemannian manifold, actually isn't quite close enough to the actual object. And, and I, I'm, so I'm very curious to know kind of what, what, is the, what is the general, if you run into a, kind of a problem of that kind, what is the general way of solving it? Uh, the general way of solving it, uh, I don't know if it's general enough, but basically uh, one standard trick you can use is um, encoding the lack of ordering as an action of some sort. So you basically say, I don't just have a Riemannian manifold, but I have a Riemannian manifold with some action on top of it that somehow permutes stuff. And so the idea is that when you link um, your hypergraph to this thing, um, the action is taking care of you know, sorting and doing the bookkeeping about, um, among all the possible orderings without you having to do it. The other way is that obviously you can either relax or make more requirements saying like my hypergraphs are actually hypergraphs with something or my manifolds are not exactly Riemannian, but they are Riemannian plus something else. This really is the fine tuning that depends on, on your problem. But in general, you could look at, uh, for instance, what people have done with nominal sets, uh, which is actually, I think, a similar problem in a way. So like, you know, that in lambda calculus, you have alpha equivalence. You can always say, if I have a fresh variable, I can rename a variable with this other thing and nothing ever changes. Uh, the problem is that this is way uh, more difficult to, to do when you're actually doing, you know, formal verification kind of stuff. Uh, 
And basically people started thinking about a machinery, a type theory that automatically keeps tracking of all these possible substitution business that you can do. Uh, and so instead of basically saying, oh yeah, there's alpha equivalence, but you never explicitly model it in your formalism, you actually do it. You, you actually say, okay, I'm actually considering now not just sets of variables, but sets with permutation actions on top of them in a way so that every variable renaming just amounts to, you know, click, um, press a button, apply this action to the set, and this thing automatically reverberates to my whole theory and everything is consistently taken care of. So that, that could probably be a solution. I don't know your problem in, uh, in detail, and I'm for sure not ex an expert in differential geometry, uh, differential topology, and this sort of stuff. But uh, yes, I would say that group actions uh, and actions in general are probably a good way to deal with permuting stuff that you, you have to keep track of. Maybe we could just, just for context here, talk for a minute about Petri nets. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, and, uh, and then, I mean, because trying to understand correspondence between these different kinds of things. Because I mean, for example, in our, in our system, you know, Petri nets are often thought of as a model of concurrency. Mm -hmm. But obviously, we have a, you know, in our multi-way graphs and things, we're also dealing with, uh, and, you know, we're dealing with also a model of concurrency. And I'd like to understand the correspondence between these. So for context, I mean, Petri nets were originally invented, as I understand it, as, as a kind of ma mathematical idealization of things like chemical reactions. Yes. So you can have, you know, various different uh, things coming in and you have, you know, this type of molecule interacts with this type of molecule to produce this type of molecule. All those interactions can happen asynchronously. And mm -hmm. you're asking the question, but you're moving, you know, a count of this number of, you know, the A type of molecule, the B type of molecule turns into a C type of molecule and so on. I mean, is, is so, so then, uh, I mean, I, I guess I've always found it difficult to understand. I mean, maybe you guys now have a, a better way to think about what a Petri net actually is, but it's always struck me as being this thing that has, has too many definitions to sound convincing, so to speak. It's got too many different, different pieces of its structure. I mean, uh, you know, it's not like a, you know, a finite state machine. It's very easy. There's a very easy description of what a finite state machine is. A Petri net, it's like, well, you've got these transitions, you've got these states, you've got these tokens. Um, it, it's um, rather complicated. I, I see your point. I spoke uh, with a researcher uh, in Japan a couple of years ago. I don't remember her name at the moment. Um, and she, she was doing research in automata theory, and she told me basically what you're telling me now. She really didn't like Petri nets because... Uh, there isn't uh, what I think she called topological uniformity. Uh, you have places and transitions that are basically different beasts that you know coexist in in some way. Uh, while in a finite state machine, basically everything is topologically the same. So you actually can think about transforming state machines as transforming graphs, for instance. And with patterns, is obviously more complicated. Um, I think that the main difference and um, what actually makes patronets interesting is that you can see them as a calculus of resources. Um, they are really able to, like a, a finite state machine is basically tell, telling you in which state you are in and what you can do in that state. While in a patronet, you, you actually know how many resources of each type you have. So for instance, in that page, I think it's Wikipedia, the one you have opened there, yeah. uh, you can interpret this diagram of saying, yeah, you have a resource of type P1, two resources of type P3, and one resource of type P4. Uh, these can maybe P1, P3, and P4 may denote molecules, for instance. So you can say I have a molecule of water, uh, two yeah, yeah, right. hydrogens, and whatever. And, and then these transitions are telling you how, how these things are, are combined. So um, let me ask a naive question. So this this is a string rewrite system, okay? Okay. And uh, I mean, this is a trivial string rewrite system where I'm just replacing B A goes to A B. Okay. So the thing that occurs to me is, if I were to take these string elements, if I were to make these strings commutative, 
So these strings are not ordered, they just have counts of A's and B's. Do I actually have a Petri net here? That is, in other words, do I have, okay, so what we've defined is a, a thing that says, uh, you know, in this particular case, we're saying BA goes to AB, right? So we have, so I'm trying to understand to what extent are these states, there's a question for, are these states like the, the places in the Petri net? And are these events like the transitions in the Petri net? I mean, in what sense is this different? So this is a stringy write system. Let's ask the very basic question. How does a stringy write system differ from a Petri net? Uh, I'm not super familiar with stringy write systems, but uh, from a theoretical point of view, I think you can identify a family of languages that are parsed by a string revive system, right? Uh, so you, you can... Mm, yes, but that's not the most useful thing. I mean, any language, if, if you have, I mean, there's a, there's a hierarchy of different kinds of string rewritings. Mm -hmm. And if you allow, I mean, you know, if you allow arbitrary string rewrites, you can parse any language. Yes. And, but that, that's so... an acceptor. That's not what a Petri net is doing is not an acceptor either. A Petri net is a transformation, not an acceptor. I mean, language parsing is usually saying there is a set of possible inputs which ones give true, they parse, and which ones gives false, they don't. But, but you can also phrase patronets in terms of parsed languages. And what you will get is something that is more powerful than the languages parsed by finite state machines and less powerful than a Turing machine. So if you can parse every language with a string rewriting system, then for it's, sure- But we're not thinking of this as a parser. We're thinking of this as a generator, much more like a patronet. We're saying you feed in three Bs and two As. Okay. And in this particular case, and, and Jonathan or somebody, maybe we can figure out how to do something where it only matters what the number of As and Bs is. It's mm -hmm. probably an easy way to do that, I'm not sure. Well, yes. I mean, without having global events, I don't think there's a way to do that, right? You mean yeah. to, to sort you, you, you can't know how many As, A's and Bs there are in the whole string unless your event takes up the whole string. Fair enough, but there, there's, there's undoubtedly a way to think about it. I mean, if it isn't a string write system, it's something else that can, can do this thing with counters, basically. What, why couldn't we have a multi-way system that does exactly what this PetriNet thing does? We, we, we absolutely could. Um, it would just be, so right now our threshold for an event application is pattern matching. But if we also had a threshold that was effectively pattern matching plus a, you know, a, plus a minimum number of tokens having been accumulated at a particular region, then, then you know that, that that would be fairly straightforward to set up a. a but but a why are we thinking about pattern matching? Why is it not just this thing? I, I'm I'm just trying to understand because because the difference, one big difference between the systems we're dealing with and systems, you know, a lot of systems people have talked about, is in our systems, you know, we say well there are these string rewrites and so on, but we say this happens ten to the one hundred times, whereas you know somebody's drawing a petri net that's representing some, uh, you know, particular thing that's happening in a blockchain somewhere or some such other thing. And you say, this is a representation where every, every node in that diagram means something. Whereas what we're saying is there might be 10 to the 100 nodes. And all they mean is they're different atoms of space, so to speak. They're not, they don't, each one doesn't have its own, you know, life and times, if that made any sense. Whereas I, I think in Petri nets, I mean, okay, when you use Petri nets, do you use them in bulk? Like, do you have a Petronet with a million entries in it? Or do you, is that not the kind of thing you think about? Um, no, especially in state books at the moment, we are not thinking about them in this way. Uh, this is what people in chemistry do. And, and you, you get very quickly to uh, what are called stochastic Petronets. So what you can do is if, if you're, imagine you have a Petronet and you know, you have a lot of tokens, like millions of tokens in each yeah. place. And you are not really interested anymore in one precise marking. So what you do is that instead of talking about tokens, you actually give concentrations to places. Sure. So you turn real numbers. I mean, you turn these entities yes. into real numbers. And then basically a Petronet will give you uh, some sort of dynamical system. So you will yeah, get It's some... just a differential equation. I mean, it, it's exactly. either an iterative map or a differential equation. Yes. Exactly. Right. Well, what we do in, uh, in, in state books, for instance, is different because uh, we are actually representing 
um, way more deterministic processes. So for instance, our patronet may represent uh, the ticketing process that someone has to go through. So, you know, there will be a starting place where there's a token that means right. nothing happened yet. And then there is a transition that is buy ticket and then maybe another one that says yeah, I get it. sell I get ticket it. and whatever. And but then the idea is that for each new user, you just instantiate a new patronet, which will keep track uh, of the status of the ticket for that user. So for instance, while working with this ticketing company, the idea is that we define a patronet that represents the life cycle of one ticket. And then if they have to sell, let's say 50,000 tickets, then they literally create 50,000 instances of these patronets. Sure. Right. And each one represents the stage uh, that particular I, ticket I get it. is right. in. Right, right. Yes. I mean, it's a, it's a modern version. It's, it's one of a variety of kinds of, uh, you know, systems that you can use to represent these kinds of processes that happen. And, and yes. presumably the importance is you can potentially make proofs on the basis of that patronet structure. Yeah, the, 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 the advantage is that uh, at least uh, this company uses uh, our system as a filter. So the idea is that if, if your ticket is in the status uh, used, it cannot be resold, for instance. And, and when I say it cannot be res resold, is because literally there isn't any transition out of the burned place, for instance. Yeah, right. so the, so in this sense, this gives you a very disciplined way uh, of knowing which actions are possible in each state. Uh, I, I, I get it. But so, yeah. so let's imagine that you had something like a Petrinet that represented the post set of all events that happen in the physical history of the universe. Okay? Yeah. Which is not the kind of post set because in your post sets, and, and by the way, I, I want to say that I think conceptually, this is very similar to what happened in the creation of our general model for physics, okay? So mm -hmm. I think in your Petri nets, when you think about Petri nets, every place, every transition in the Petri net has a name. That is, it's yes. doing something meaningful for you. It's a ticket is being shredded or a, a, a person is, you know, getting on the train or whatever, whatever else mm -hmm. it is, right? Yes. It, it means something, okay? So similarly, for me, thinking about symbolic expressions, when I write down a symbolic expression, I expect that every piece of that symbolic expression means something. It's, a, it's not just an arbitrary F, it's an F, that, it's even just a thing with name F, but it could be a plus, it could be a this, it could be a that, mm -hmm. but it means something, right? Yes. So the main feature of this model of physics is that we are using the, the structure of essentially symbolic expressions, but they mean absolutely nothing. In other words, Every piece of, you know, every element in the expression that represents the universe is just an atom of space. And there might be 10 to the 400 of those. And they don't mean anything as such, right? Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, we've got, you know, we're thinking about the, the same kinds of mathematical structures of post sets where we're saying, you know, this atom of space has to be created before this atom of space, those kinds of things. But the atoms of space, don't have, you know, it's not the case that one of them is the, uh, I don't know, the, the place where Bob lives and another one is the place where Jim lives or something. They are, they're just arbitrary atoms of space, right? So in other words, and, and I think, I mean, the thing that I'm curious about, uh, okay, so my claim, I'm maybe completely incorrect and, and, and perhaps some, uh, both with respect to something like Petri Nets and with respect to category theory, actually, that the potential use that what, what our model is doing is taking the structure of one of these things in a way that is completely devoid of meaning. So for example, when you write down one of your, you know, sequences of morphisms in, in a category, yes. right? Every morphism means something. You, you know, you're not just saying it's an arbitrary structural morphism. Mm -hmm. You're saying this morphism is a mapping from vector spaces to vector spaces. That is, it's not just, you know, they're not disembodied things. But, but so, once, you have, once you have the category, then that category can be used as a definition of those morphisms, can it not? Yes, like... Uh, yeah. So I, I think yeah. it's actually the same as what we're dealing with, right? It's the same with Petri nets, right? So it, it, if you, as long as you know, if you know the arcs, if you know the places and you know the flow relations, 
then it doesn't actually matter what the individual objects are called. What matters is the combinatorial structure of the Petri net. Right? Yes, but as a practical matter, when people are thinking about this, the Petri net... The fact that they put things like P1, T1, P2, and so on on them shouldn't really I know, matter. But that's the, that's the use case, right? I mean, it's just like, if you'd said to me, just imagine in Wolfram language that you're dealing with expressions that mean absolutely nothing. You're just structurally throwing around you know, disembodied expressions where every function is the function f. It doesn't do anything, right? Okay. I would have said, what use is that? It's never going to be useful for anything, right? It's, it's because it's just, it's, but yet that's the basis for our model of physics. In other words, it might not be when we think about, uh, so I'm just trying to get the mindset of thinking about things like category theory as a, as a purely structural thing. So you, you're talking about category theory as a way to understand the correspondence between, you know, something in differential topology and something in, uh, you know, I don't okay, know. Okay, okay, I, I get what you need. Um, I think probably one thing we could try to dive into a bit is the Gretchen deconstruction. It's uh, certainly not the easiest thing ever, but it's exactly a way to basically take some semantic information and making it purely syntactic. So basically you start with things that have meaning and somehow you compile and embed this meaning to something into something which is actually purely combinatorial. So this may be interesting, maybe. For Let, you. Let's try, let me just try a couple of other things just and then we can perhaps dive into that. I mean, so, mm -hmm. so one of the things that we had thought about a little bit is, uh, Okay, let, let's just go through a few things. So this multi-way graph, let me just let me just comment on a few bits and pieces here. So, so this, let me just draw it. Yeah, and obviously totally trivial point, but uh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between execution semantics for a Petri net and event selection functions for a multi-way system. Okay, that's interesting. Right, because Petri nets by definition highly trivial point. No, actually, well, no, but, I mean, no, Petri nets no, by, no. by definition are just not they're non-deterministic, right? Because you can have multiple transitions that fire from. I see, I see, I see. So, so, in, so in general, you define function. an execution so semantics. Petri net evolutions are multi-way systems. Yes, right, but but in practice, people define execution semantics to prevent the non-determinism, um, which is I exactly see. what That's we do with event selection function. functions in multi-way systems. So so okay, so Fabrizio, um, Matteo, just to make sure we understand what a multi-way system is, because that's going to be without that, we're going to be lost. Okay, so a multi-way system just says we're we have some transformation. In this particular case, it's just a stringy like transformation. B A goes okay. to A B. Okay. And all this is saying is you apply that transformation wherever you can. Okay. Okay. So we can think of this. So for example, this is a um uh, you can also think of this as a proof. This is the proof that BBBAA is equivalent to AABBB with the rule that BA is equivalent to AB. Okay, this is okay. a proof, and the proof, we can say a particular proof would be some path through here that leads from the input to the output. Yes. Right? And so, so this is, so that's our multi-way system and in our world, I mean, we can talk about how this relates to quantum mechanics and who knows what else, but this is, this is a structural object in, in our world, okay? And, and so what, you know, one question would be, okay, so that, that's one thing. Next level is the evolution events graph. So this is saying, this is dual. So what, what, this, is, what this is doing is it's saying, for every one of these transitions from this state to this state, that happens by virtue of an event. Okay. That event says, this is the BA that we're rewriting as AB. In this case, there are two BAs that we could rewrite as, as AB. They're in different places, they lead to different outputs. Sometimes there will be a merging of those outputs and so on. Okay. Right? So this particular case, this is a confluent rewrite system. So even though there are many branches, we always converge. The yeah, same. they always convert, but that's not always the case. Clearly, that's correct. Yeah, okay. that's correct. It's it might be the case in physics. Um, it it is quite significant if it's the case in physics, but um, 
Uh, I mean, it happens to lead to special relativity and it leads to uh, you know, quantum objectivity and all kinds of other important things in physics, but that, that, that's irrelevant to this. So the first thing that one might think of is, insofar as this picture here could be thought of as related to an actual uh, you know, diagram of morphisms in a category. I mean, that is, we can think of these states, presumably, as a category. And we could think about these transitions between states as morphisms in that category. Yes, that's, that's correct. That, that's absolutely right. possible. And uh, at the moment, if your system is, is one, your category will be a poset, which means that there is at most one morphism between uh, any two states. But obviously, if, if you have more than one way to go from one state to the other, and you don't want to, let's say, identify them, then you just have a category. Okay. And, and, and then notions like confluence and causal invariance can be interpreted in terms of statements about the existence of co-cones for associated cones and things like this. In for categories. Yes. In, yeah. Right. I mean, the, the statement of global confluence is effectively a statement that for every cone, there is an associated co-cone. Uh, what is a cone in a category? Is it a light cone or is it something completely and utterly different? No, no, it's something completely different. It's the... Are you sure it's different? Uh, yeah, I, yes. I mean, I don't see an immediate correspondence between light cones and this kind of stuff. Jonathan? But I, what is yeah, a cone? I, I also think that they're different. What uh, is a I'll, cone? I'll, how do you see cones in, in this case? Like, what, what are the cones and the co-cones? And... Well, so if you have, um, so for instance, okay, uh, actually, this is, this is kind of a bad example. If you, Give me if, a better if, example. In this, um, uh, I'll see if I can construct one in just a moment. I, I, can't, I, I can't speak and do a construction at the same time. Okay. Um, but uh, so obviously, my understanding of a cone is that you, know, you, you have some object N, and then you have, and you have some family of morphisms that lead yes, it. Yes, it's, it's literally a cone. Things. You have a diagram right. here in, in your category, and you have another object in the category with a lot of morphism that go to each thing in this diagram, so that everything right. commutes. Exactly. Yes. And so my understanding is of a cocone is it's the dual notion of that. If you reverse yes. all the arrows, you get a cocone, right? Perfect. So yes. anytime you get a bifurcation in one of our multi-way systems, I think, you can represent that in terms of the existence of a cone, right? Because the, 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 the predecessor element is the common element for which, to, for which you're applying a family of morphisms. And then as long as there exists an associated co-cone, then you're saying that eventually that bifurcation will eventually reconverge. And what is the difference between that and our friendly entanglement cones? Isn't it exactly the same thing? Um, it's certainly related. It's certainly related. The, 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 the main distinction being that with an entanglement cone, just like with a light cone, you have to pick an orientation. You have to effectively pick a foliation, right? You have to pick a direction in which to orient it. Whereas the, whereas the category theoretic notion of a cone is, in this context, is purely combinatorial. So, so it should be- well, It's a geodesic cone, yes? You're just going a certain number of morphisms down. So- Well, you're going one morphism down. The problem in this example is that I, I mean, I understand you can say every time I have a bifurcation, I can represent this as a cone, but I don't know if then these cones will compose in the way you want. Uh, and in particular, it's difficult for me to see, like, it's like your base category changes all the time. Right. Why do you right. say that? What, why is the base category here not the category of strings? Um, well, it can be, but then, like, what are the morphisms between strings and how, I mean... It's, the, it's this function. It's this thing that says... Yeah, but I, that I understand, but then I don't understand why some other thing has to be taken to be the tip of the cone. Like, I, I don't really understand how you distinguish cones in this setting. Uh, Let me ask this question. So maybe we shouldn't go to cones, but if, if I ask the question for this graph, right, in yes. order to make this a valid category theoretic, is it the case that I have to do the transitive closure to make this be a valid category theoretic diagram? Mm, it, again, it re really depends on uh, what you want to capture. In this case, it feels to me that each uh, arrow in this graph represents just composing with a morphism. 
So actually, you don't want to take the drastic closure. You want to consider all the possible paths on, on this graph. Uh, okay, but, but it won't be the case that, that the associativity that you normally have in category theory, does it apply in this case or not? To the I more think so, yes. Here? Yes, yes, why not? Yes, I think it does. Right. If, if you if you say instead of an evolution edge representing a single application of an updating event, it, it represents an, an update sequence. So in other words, if you take the reflexive transitive closure of the of the updating yes, exactly. uh, relation, that then you end up with um, that you end up with a category. So so wait a minute. You're saying... my relativity paper. <laughs> OK, so wait a minute. Walk me through that. So you're saying you're saying what so, do I so, do here? So if you say if you take the reflexive uh, if sorry, if you take the um, if you take the the, the the symmetric closure of uh, whatever it is, the union of the uh, rewrite relation and the identity relation, then, so, so effectively, if each edge is saying, it, not just that this state can be directly rewritten to this state, but this state can be rewritten to this state by some finite, poten potentially uh, zero uh, rewrite sequence. But, but isn't that this picture here? Yes. That's the transitive closure picture. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I, I plus self loops, right? Because you, you're allowing for um, rewrite re, rewrite sequences of length zero. Fine. Okay, but so so what I was but asking yeah, before, I, I'm, is, not, I'm not disagreeing. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So this is the thing that will be sort of the category theoretic way of representing, with the morphism being uh, rewrite among strings, the category of strings, and then this would be the a representation of that category with its morphisms. In category theory, is that a fair, fair statement? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to to really understand. Like, I, I I understand what you're saying. I'm just not sure that this is the most insightful way of categorifying this notion. Uh, yes, okay. you, that that's but, right. So let me just go on because I think there's something potentially interesting that happens. So here, we've got the dual of this. Effectively, what we're looking at is these these events that correspond to each edge here, each morphism basically here, mm -hmm. is being turned into um, what we're now asking. So now we can ask for, so if I make the, let's see, the causal graph, well, let's see, what do, I, what do I want to, evolution causal graph. So this will make this rather, oh, gosh, this rather complicated thing. And my claim would be, this is the higher order category version of that previous category. Because what's happening here is the morphisms of the previous category are being, they get morphisms of their own that map onto other morphisms in that previous category. So in other words, these causal edges, which represent the causal dependence of one uh, event, one update event on another, I would claim, maybe wrongly, that that's, that corresponds to a, a second order category from uh, that. Yes, called a two category. It may be, but there are quite a lot of laws we, we have to check to, to make sure that this is the case. Uh, the, so uh, yeah, I mean, intuitively what you say seems uh, absolutely possible, but uh, th there but so, are axioms to check. Okay, so but the, I want to understand what we get for having those axioms be true, so to speak. But, but also, just to understand this, in the case of, if I thought of this as a proof, for example, here, mm -hmm. I, you know, it's a proof that BBBAA is equal to AABBB, right? Okay. Then, then I can imagine a higher order, so the correspondence between proofs between, uh, would be a two category, is that correct? Uh, yes, you, you, you may say that. You, you can say that as two morphisms, so an higher order morphism between morphisms uh, expresses some kind of relationship between two proofs. Right. Like uh, you could say that, for instance, you have a morphism if one proof is a rewriting of another proof, for instance, or something similar. Right. So, I mean, for, for us, Actually, that makes me think about, Jonathan, that makes me think about Ruleal space and the translations in Ruleal space between different, between, for example, different Turing machine paths. That, right. that is, is like the rewriting of one proof into another proof. 
I'm not sure, sure if that's correct. But but I'm trying to understand. So so then. Well, any, any of these things can be interpreted that way. It doesn't matter whether it's branchial or rulial. It's just that in once in, in, in the rulial case, you're allowed a, a, an, an infinite parametric family of axioms as opposed to a countable set of axioms. Okay, or fair a, enough. A finite but, set of axioms. But but then physically, the two category is corresponding to causal edges, and presumably, uh, we we I think we talked about this before. That the three category would correspond to taking these causal edges and asking for a relation between causal edges, and that corresponds to a foliation of the space. So it seems like in our models, what's happening is the raw evolution of states is like a one category situation. The causal graphs are like a two category situation. The foliations are like a three category situation, I think, maybe. And so then I'm obviously going to ask the question, the analog of the infinity category, what, what might that represent? I mean, how can I think about uh, for example, in the case of proofs, what is the analog? So if I say there's a, you know, there is a, this is a collection of proofs. There's now a mapping from one proof to another. Then I can imagine a mapping between mappings between proofs. Yes. How, yes. how do I think about that, that infinite hierarchy of things? Well, uh, this is what they do in homotopic type theory, basically. Uh, the idea is that you can uh, think about a proof as a term of a given of an equality type. So if I give you a type A equals B, the terms of this type are proofs that A equals B. Okay. And then you can say um, morphisms between proofs are proofs that these proofs are equal. Because, for, for instance, yes. what, I, what I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, for in, in a computer, in a theorem prover, you can prove that A equals B by rewriting some things. And obviously, you can give two different proofs uh, that are two different rewriting orders. And most often than not, if you work in like uh, Coq or Idris, uh, your compiler will be too stupid to understand that these two proofs are proving the same thing like you know they were treated as different and so uh, if at some point you have to prove that these two proof objects are the same then you have to do another rewriting between proofs and you see that you can iterate these up to infinity so you can have proof between proofs proofs between proofs between proofs and and that's why you need an infinity category because right but so so what's the i mean for us here each path through this graph is a proof. Mm -hmm. And so the, the statement, the, the proof of the equivalence of proofs is a statement that you can make a transformation between one of these graphs and another. But I'm trying to get an intuition for the infinity category. What, what does it mean? So the proof of, you know, for us, again, the one category is actual time evolution. The two category is causal connections between pieces of time evolution. The three category is uh, the construction of reference frames, the construction of a foliation. So I'm trying to get an intuition. If we went beyond that to the four category, five category, up to infinity, what is that? Corresponding to what is that? What is the potential interpretation of that? Well, it's the. I think it's the weakest version uh, uh, categorification you can you can um, you can give because what you what you are having is what, what you create is a category which is very very granular and it basically allows you to consider every different way of transforming different things as distinct by keeping track of um, what is equivalent to what without doing any identification so this is what an infinity category does for you, usually. You, you know, like you, you can basically view, for instance, uh, one category as a two category where all the um, two morphisms have been trivialized. So you basically say either, right. uh, you know, you identify everything that is uh, too isomorphic and, and blah, blah, blah. 
And then you can say, well, actually two categories, an example of three categories where we have identified the three morphisms and you can go all the way up. Uh, so basically, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert in infinity category theory, but what I know is that the reason why they are becoming so relevant now in automated theorem prover, theorem proving is because theorem provers are too dumb to understand if two things are equal, um, unless they are either syntactically equal or you give the prover a way to transform, to rewrite one into the other. And so that's why you basically want to create work with a type theory that is as weak as possible and allows you to, you know, keep track of all these equivalences somehow automatically, let's say. Um, can, I, can I give a more topological interpretation of that idea? Yeah. So, so the, 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 the basic concept is if you, if you regard your type as a, as a topological space and you regard the terms in that type as being, uh, as being points in that space, then each proof is effectively a path in that space, right? It's a path mapping one, one, one point onto another. And then, uh, and then as, as Fabrizio says, that then equivalences between proofs are then homotopies between those paths, right? The, but the idea in homotopy type theory is, is, to, is to go up, you know, all, all these different levels of abstraction but, uh, of equivalences between these homotopies to construct through an infinity groupoid construction, this thing called the homotopy type in which there, there is only one kind of equivalence, the weak homotopy equivalence. And then that natural, because of the, the nature of weak homotopy equivalence, that induces all of the lower order equivalence relations right the way down. Right, so, so all you have to do is one, one kind of uh, equivalence checking in this homotopy space generated by the infinity groupoid, and then you're done. Then, then all of the other layers of the hierarchy are already accounted for. That, that's, the, that's the basic idea. That's why, that's why hot is, uh, yeah, as Fabrizio says, is, is so relevant to kind of to modern. Okay, basic. let me try to understand that a little better. Okay, so in our case, we have a, um, uh, you know, this is our simple model for your, you know, this is paths in a space. Now I can imagine, I'm still a little confused here. There's a homotopy. We can ask, are we asking between these two different paths? Expl explain the homotopy statement there. Yeah, so, so, so then you, you say that those proofs are genuinely equivalent proofs if there exists a homotopy between them. And what, how will we define a homotopy in this case? Well, so, so you, you obviously you have to you have to induce some topology and have some notion of continuity, but you know basically an elementary notion of homotopy in this in this instance would just be a direct mapping of states onto states, edges onto edges that would allow you to transform one path into another. So you're them. saying in the in the continuum limit of the multiway graph, you're saying there should be a genuine homotopy. Yes, if that if that continuum limit exists, then there should be a genuine. So if if you if you genuinely took the you know, the, 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 the space, the topological space of, of some particular type, the topological space effectively of all, of all proofs, um, then, yeah, then it would be a bona fide homotopy. Okay, but so, so for us, we get to actually have a concrete version of what the topological space of all proofs looks like. Yes, it's absolutely. The, it's the limit, which we don't yet understand, it's the continuum limit of the multiway graph, right? So I can, so for example, with this multiway graph, I can make a very, very big one. And maybe I can think about that as being continuum limit. So then your homotopy statement is what there? Because it's not obvious to me why, how you set up topology on, I mean, you're, you're saying- Okay, can, can, I, can, I, can I put it in a slightly different way that's more directly ATP related? Yeah. So right now, if you call find equational proof, it works with theorem, hypotheses and axioms that are pure equivalences between symbolic expressions. Um, but the proof object that you get out is itself a symbolic expression. So it could be that we could also call find equational proof with hypotheses and axioms that were equivalences between proof objects. It happens that we don't currently support that, although I've thought a bit about how you might do it. And what, what you could get out, and one thing that I'm interested in potentially implementing, would be then you could have a rewrite sequence because e you know, each step in, in, in standard proof object just between you know, zero order symbolic expressions is just a rewrite relation and a position. Yeah. But then you can you can then apply a rewrite relation to that rewrite relation, right? That that rewrite relation has two paths. It has a left and a right, and then it has sub-expressions within the left and right. Yep, yep. You can apply rewrite rules to that, and so then you could get a proof of equivalence between two proof objects, subject to certain axioms about equivalences between proof objects, and, and and so on. So then so then you could construct some higher order generalization of fine equational proof 
And each one of those higher order pieces can be thought of as being a homotopy between proofs in the lower order. Okay, so let's just think about that for a second. So, I mean, one thing is we are inadequately categorified in some sense, in the sense that our programs equals data are not, is not quite good enough because our proof objects have a rather different structure from the objects about which we are making proofs right now. I mean, in other words, if we look at a proof object here, you know, this is a, this is a thing which is qualitatively similar, but it isn't exactly the same, doesn't have exactly the same structure as the actual things that we're making proofs about. But let's assume, so in this case, with this proof, could we make, what is the proof object? The proof object is a path here, right? Yes. Right? Right. So you're saying that what we're doing is we're saying the original object is a string, the proof object is a path. We're now asking for uh, correspondences between paths, correct? Right. So, 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 so you can construct a, a multi-way system. Continuous deformations of these paths what are, what are continuous deformations of these paths mean? Without a continuum limit, we don't have a good notion of continuous deformation. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it makes sense to, 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 I mean, continuous deformation is somehow implying that this thing lives in some kind of continuous space, but there isn't a nice way to represent this. In this, this well, but so maybe what not. Happens I mean, maybe there's an proof. obvious. Go ahead. No, I'm just I'm saying like uh, that maybe we can attach a topology to this just from the, the rules, yes, the rewrite. Uh, rules. The, the, the most meaningful kind of topology you could attach to this thing is called the uh, Grothendieck topology, I think. Where did you say Grothendieck? What did you say? Grothendieck, yes. He's a, he's a big figure in this whole infinity category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything, it's, I've just it's never like known how to pronounce this. Fields name. where as soon as you hear a particular name, you know you're going into deep abstraction. And Grothendieck is yeah. one of those names where, where um, uh, you know, where very fascinating ideas, but typically very abstract. So what, what he did is he, he basically took the axioms of topology. So, you know, finite intersection, arbitrary unions, and categorified them, um, which basically means that now you can uh, endow a category with a topology called the great Nico topology in a way so that if what you started from is just a topological space, then you're, you have a way to create a great Nico topology that coincides with the one you started from. But in this case, this is, I think, particularly relevant because um, these graphs can be seen as posets. And so as soon as you start considering the category of paths over these graphs, then this thing gives you a, a nice toolkit to think about topologies over this thing. Okay, and I want to understand growth and deep topologies. This may be a tall order, this may be difficult, but I want to understand what, how these work. Uh, so. so the first thing um, you have to understand is uh, the concept of sieve. Uh, the idea of a sieve is that you pick one vertex in your graph, uh, whatever you want. So uh, is this a graph that I could use as my Yeah, sample? we can use this one, no problem. So if, okay. you, if you pick like the one, one random I'll vertex. pick that vertex. Perfect, okay. So a sieve is a set of arrows into that vertex, which is- right, I'm gonna pick this vertex instead, just to give my, me some more arrows. Okay. Uh, no, it's into, it's not from. So if you pick that one, there are less arrows that is, are going in there. All right, okay, fine. Okay, fine. so you take this one and basically the idea is that every set of arrows that are closed by pre-composition form a sieve. So for instance, you can generate a sieve by taking the arrow that goes um, upwards, the first one that goes from B A B A B to B B A A B, let's say. Um, nope. Uh, if, you, if you go back to the, the, the selected vertex. Which one? The, this vertex here. Uh, so if you take that vertex here, there is only one possible seed on the first vertex, which okay. is the empty one, because you don't have any arrow going in. Now, if you take the, the one, two, three, four, the four to one vertically from the first one, one, no, that down. One. 
No, no. Uh, okay, if you take okay, let's pick that one. In that case, you are willing us uh, to increase the size even more. Let's let's increase one more step. The problem is, if we increase too much more, we won't be able to see much of a graph. Okay, there we okay. go. So if you take um, B B A B A, B B A B is the second one. Okay, this one here. Yep. Uh, is is you know it's it's the second one from the top. This one here. Uh, where is your mouse? Yes, yeah, yeah. It, it's that one. That one. Oh, I think, okay, yes. Oh, you may uh, have a delay for the mouse. Yes, exactly. That's <laughs> so BBA, BA, you can have only two possible sieves there. The first one is the empty one, so you could do not consider any arrow. And the second one is the one that goes from uh, BBBAA to BBA, BA. Okay. Yep. And now, if you go uh, to B, A, B, A, B, uh, you see that the situation is a bit more um, uh, various because you can have the empty seam, but then you have two different arrows going into that vertex. Uh, so you can either consider the sieve that goes from uh, that is generated by the arrow that goes from BA, BBA to BA, BA, B. Yep. And again, if you take this arrow, you have to also take the, this arrow composed with the other one that goes into BA, BBA, and the one, this one also has to be composed with BBA, BBA, A. So these things okay. have to be downward closed. Okay, so, so wait a minute. So all we're doing here is we're taking... The, we're, we're going backwards up the arrows that lead yes, to a particular state. Precisely. Okay. So I understand. You, what you can do is you take, basically, you say a sieve is just a set of arrows which is closed with respect to this going backwards kind of thing. Okay. Wait a minute. You're saying a sieve as in S-I-E-V-E or something? Different? Yes. Sieve, okay. precisely. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so that, right, okay. In graph theory, isn't that just what's the function that does that for us? Um, vertex and component. Vertex and components, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Right. So, so this, right. Okay. So you're saying it's the vertex, the infinite vertex and component of the particular uh, node is the sieve of that node. Is that correct? Uh, you can have many sieves because. Uh, Again, for instance, in the case of BA, BA, B, I can start by considering only one of these two arrows that go in, or none of them at all, or both of them. Right, but so, so what we're saying is there's a vertex in component for BA, BA, B, and we could say, for example, the one level vertex in component is just that. Those are the things that will lead into, that's the zeroth vertex in component, the thing itself. Mm -hmm. That's the one that is that pre-image there, so to speak, then that pre-image. If I go to the two-level vertex in component, I'll get that state there. I can go to the three-level one and so on. But you are thinking in terms of um, vertexes now. Well, you should rethink in terms of edges. The CV okay, is a fine. set of edges. But... Okay, fine. Okay, uh, all right. So we've got those edges. We can, we can generate those. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly how to do that. That's probably the... Um... But, you know, the, 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 the interesting thing is that um, there, there are, again, many different sieves that you can put on the same thing. Because after you specify basically a bunch of arrows, you have to do the infinite, like, downward composition with all the other arrows that you, you have. But, but, for instance, if I say, okay, what is the sieve generated on BA, BA, B by the empty set, then this is the empty seed because you know you just don't have any arrows to start with, so you don't have to do any sort of composition. If you only start with the arrow that goes that starts in BA BBA, then you only have to take care of that sort of path and not right, the okay. But we've got a construction for the sieve. Now what do we do with the sieve? Now, the point is that uh, these things uh, can be used uh, to um, axiomatize the equivalent of an open covering of a topological space. So uh, an open covering of topological spaces is just you know, a bunch of open sets so that their union uh, covers the entire space, topological space we have. I see. About. 
Uh, and in this case, the idea is that for each vertex, you want to choose a sieve and you want to do it in a way so that there is some compatibility conditions between different sieves uh, that are listed in the Greek topology page. And basically what this gives uh, is uh, a abstract axiomatization of open covering, which does not uh, need, you know, uh, to talk about topological spaces. And this thing really formally behaves like an open covering in topology. So this thing uh, basically allows you to, to use a lot of geometric machinery, even on spaces that are actually discrete, like this one. And, and, and then, you know, after you have a notion of open covering, you will automatically, if you, if, if you deep dive enough into this stuff, you will um, obtain um, an appropriate notion of um, homotopic equivalence, for instance. So you may obtain an appropriate notion of continuous function and continuous deformation. So the idea is that since this thing doesn't really look naively as a topological space, this is the like most abstract way to put a topology on it. Uh, and that would be the thing I would start from also because... Uh, May I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Um, is there some freedom in how you how you attach this topology? Yes, or is absolutely. it sort of like no, so? No, so no. we do have some choice here, but we could make a, a topology that's somehow compatible with the rules that Absol generated this that. Topology. That's exactly what you want to do. That's exactly mm. what you want to do. Yes. So you can see that there are, for instance, two let's say trivial choices of topologies that you can take here. The first one is for each vertex, you take the biggest sieve you can. So you just consider literally all the arrows going in that vertex. You do this for all vertex, all vertexes. And the other obvious choice is the to take the empty sieve for each vertex. And these two things should both give you uh, two examples of great and topologies. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of possible choices in the middle, um, which, um, Yes, you should actually do in, in, in a way that is compatible with your um, computational rules. Because in that case, then you are obtaining some geometric representation of what you're doing computationally. And, and, and that- Okay, so how would we do this? This sounds very interesting, but what do we actually do here? So we're trying to make open sets. We're trying to make something which is some kind of growth in Dickian analog of an open set. Mm -hmm. Open covering, our, yes. Okay. Um, how do we do it? Well, I'm done like like this on uh, impromptu. I am not sure I can answer this question. I don't know if Matteo has some idea with this. But... I think it's relevant here to understand that a sieve, it's a set of ways to get to the specific node of the graph you are considering. So in I guess in your model, it might be interesting to look at C's as a, the causal paths that you can have attached to a certain node. Right. Because so there's more information there than is represented in this graph, right? So the yeah, exactly. particular yes. intricate causal structure is being lost here, but maybe that's the right source. Yeah, of sense. And, and so, so geometrically, the way to interpret this is that, am I right in saying that each, each such choice of, of uh, sort of uh, open subsets to consider part of your sieve corresponds to a different choice of open immersions of this uh, you know, of, of that open set. A different choice of of of, of immersions. I'm I'm trying to get a geometrical intuition for why for for how, how we think about this freedom to choose which family of open subsets to consider part of the sieve. Is is that some freedom of of, of choice of immersion uh, locally around that set? Uh, so, uh, yeah, basically in the topological case, uh, in which sieves actually end up corresponding, Gretendic topologies are, uh, end up corresponding to open coverings, uh, basically your nodes would be the open sets of some topology and right. your arrows would be inclusions. Right, right, exactly. So, so, the, so then, the, then the freedom to choose your sieve is exactly the statement that there are, there, are, there are many different possible sets of open immersions for those open sets. Exactly. So yeah, right. the idea is that, yeah, you are Which basically- Which is pretty much what we expected, I think. 
Yes, so you're basically saying, okay, given this open set, I'm considering this set of opens that somehow embed into this thing in different yes. ways. Yes. Right. And then you see that since you are for, for each open set, you are considering a lot of other open sets that embed into it, you want to do it in a compatible way because you are going to do this for each open set. So you want to be sure that these inclusions, they all behave well with respect to each other, basically. But that's right. which, which, sorry, go ahead. Like, you can, I mean, I think the most intuitive uh, uh, notion of topology here is actually the notion of coverage, which is just a choice of arrows you, you admit as your past arrows, okay, in your node. And then you can generate everything to get C's, and then you get a proper topology. But like when you specify a covering for an open set, you specify like a family of sets covering. But like the true notion of C if, uh, corresponding to that should be not only the open sets you choose, but also their subsets, right? Yes. But that's right, something right. that you, you get freely. You know, you just specify the big ones, and you say those are the ones I the chunks of the space that I want to consider separately. And yes. then whatever is inside the chunk gets gets along, and same for the compatibility condition. You add, you add them freely. Exactly. So, so, so with, with the evolution add. causal graph, all of these all of these properties I, th I think are satisfied recursively because each of these each each possible choice of open immersion effectively corresponds to a different choice of updating order, or a different choice of of, uh, of of space like hypersurface foliation. And so yes. as long as that is consistent with the causal partial order, then we we know that that is also a valid open immersion for all of the open subsets. And so then that, that gives us a valid Grotendieck Gr topology. Okay, hold on. That sounds uh, very in terms interesting. Of what I need, I need, I, let me try to understand that. Okay, so you're saying we look at the evolution causal graph. Right, right. So, so my, my, my point is simply, you know, so uh, to, to the extent that I understand it, each choice of sieve, which is a, a, you know, a, a choice of open immersion around, uh, for some open set, is really just a choice of updating order in the context of a multi-way system, right? Because it's a, it's a choice of a collection of incoming arrows. That should be correct, yes. Right. So, and, and we have a way of parameterizing that in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of collections of space-like separated updating events that, uh, that satisfy the causal partial order. So the condition that these things, uh, that they play nicely with each other is the condition that, it's, that they're compatible with the causal partial order. And then if they're compatible with the causal partial order, then we also know that in order to get to that point, they had to have been compatible with the previous causal edges. And so, not, not only do we get the, the, the validity of the open subsets in that sieve, we also get the validity of the, of the immersion of the open subsets in those open subsets and so on. So, so all we need to know is the evolution causal graph, I think. So you're claiming that these different choices of open sets are different, are effectively different foliations of our, uh, of our system. Well, that, that, was, that was why I was asking about, that was exactly why I asked about immersions, because I think that's, that's the correct way to think about it. So, so you more. think that the choice of open sets, just so I understand, so you think the choice of open sets is basically exactly equivalent to the choice of foliations? May, may I support this with another way of looking at this, please? Because Grottingit topologies are actually <laughs> an instance of an even more general notion of topology with a low vir tier knee topology, right? And that's more logical in its interpretation because a low virtual topology is defined uh, as a kind of a modal operator on, on the logic of your category. We don't need to dive into this. But the point is that you can consider choosing these open sets as a way to choose uh, in which way you can assess the truth of a statement in that point, all right? So I guess that it's really supporting the, the foliation interpretation since I mean, I can get to this point in many ways, but uh, as a observer there, I have these sets of things that I look at if I want to assess the truth of a statement here. Exactly. So, exactly. Okay. Kind of it, so, so explain I, that. So, so this, my, my, this question is, my point is this: spell this type of. I didn't get what the spell this type of topology. The, the, uh, do you say the Lovier Tierney? Is that how you? Yeah. Lovier Tierney. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Spell how. Uh, L A W V E R E, L A W V E R E T I E R N E Y. I think. But it, there's a there's a dash. Th th there's a dash. Okay, okay, I've heard of yes. this. Yes. All right. I'm just try I was trying to decode Tierney or something. Is that right? All right. Yes. Okay. And so th this is a. Explain what this is again. 
I mean, this is defined in the context of topos theory, which is like, yeah, really big uh, subject to touch now. But anyway, in any category as a notion of logic, which is internal to the category. It's like a language I can associate to a category to speak about the objects of the category, yeah. all right? And Maybe some is, stupid example. If your category is a product, then logically this means that in your category you have a notion of taking pairs of things. Yes. Or for example, the, the closer structure we were talking about, yeah. which was the arrow. That's something you can use in your logic, in your internal logic, uh, to, to make function types. Okay. Right. So but that, that's a pretty big uh, argument. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so, Jonathan, can, can you explain? Because yeah. you understand yes. more. Right, right. So, so, whereas before, you know, okay, in, in the context of what we were discussing earlier, right, we, we, had, we were discussing these notions of like a type theoretic interpretation of true and false, right? You, as Fabrizio mm -hmm. said, you have, the, you have this type true, which has a single element, you have a type false, which has no elements. And then, and then you can say a statement is true or false depending on whether the type true or false is inhabited for that statement, right? The, the, the notion of a lower Tierney topology, again, to the extent that I understand it, is that it gives you a way of generalizing that idea so you can speak of local truth, right? So you can say that, you can say that a type, that the truth, truth type is locally inhabited with respect to the topos, even if it isn't globally inhabited. So yep. if, 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 in the context of like homotopy type theory, that allows you to say that certain theorems are, are kind of correct locally within the region of that, of that, uh, of that term, but, not, but exactly. may or may not be globally true. Exactly. And the one way to see this is that basically um, you are, it's not really the proper form of word, but enriching your truth values. So instead of, for instance, you say a logical formula in set is something that goes, you know, to zero one. So you can say you have an, an evaluation function that takes a formula and maps it to zero or to one if the formula is true or false, for instance. And instead, what you have in this case is that your topology of the underlying space will um, give you the structure of the truth values in, in your category. So you don't have any more true and false, but you have true at, basically. Exactly. In these open sets. Yes. So, so, so to give a kind of uh, to give a homotopy type theory find equational proof interpretation of that, you know, so if, if you consider if you consider the topological space that corresponds to, you know, in, in homotopy type theory to, to the type that is, you know, all, 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 st all theorems that you can prove using find equational proof, right, you can pick a particular term that corresponds, say, to the statement of commutativity. And you can say that that associated proposition is true locally, if, if by locally you mean kind of in the context of like abelian group theory or something, even though it isn't true globally in, this, in the context of you know, non-abelian group theory. This is intuitively and in principle true, uh, but you are treading a very difficult field because uh, you are basically considering at the same time um, an infinity category and a top of structure where a topos is basically the kind of place where you know you can talk about this internal logic in the right way right way uh, the, problem uh, the problem is that the infinity toposes topos are not exactly the simplest thing ever actually this is the actual frontier i think of algebraic geometry uh, i think people have figured out stuff probably up to infinity to toposes but um, in general, this is a very complicated theory. And I think there are some sort of uh, conjectures that basically postulates or proved that the internal logic of an infinity topos is actually homotopic type theory or some flavor of homotopic type theory. But this is, this is for sure something I'm not versed uh, in, but it's also something that is... Uh, still uh very uh being like researched on so, so I, 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 the, the, there's definitely a proof correspondence between i think homotopy type theory and um and lovia tianic topologies for some very restricted case i, I forget it was something like pre sheaf topoi or something but I, i've definitely seen seen results in that area but so i want to come back to this correspondence between open sets and foliations okay what do we yes, learn from please. that correspondence what's that you mean, you mean open um, emotion? Well, 
what, what's the correspondence okay. with open sets? You're saying a whole folio. Yeah, so it sounded like something really. Yeah, so an open set would obviously just be a vertex. And then the open immersion would be the collection of updating events that led to that vertex, or the collection of causal edges between updating events that led to that vertex. But what kind of a vertex here? A state vertex. Is an open set. I think you can treat it as one. Yeah, so the idea is that formally you, you see it as an open set. So uh, j just to, to okay, let, let, me, let me just uh, digress for a second. Uh, are you familiar with the idea of pointless topology? I don't think I am. I think I, I understand. So, I got as far as point set topology, but not yeah, so less topology. Basically, Im imagine this. We know that uh, topological, if you take the set of open sets of um, a topological space, they form a complete distributed lattice. You know, you, you can take arbitrary unions, finite yes. intersections. So at some point, someone said, well, but I mean, the interesting topological properties actually come from the structure of the open sets and no one really cares about the points. So why don't we instead study complete distributed lattices and try to generalize uh, topological statements to properties of these lattices? And that's more or less what we are doing here. This is not anymore a topology in that strictly geometric sense. But the idea is, thanks to the great topology, we can imagine that these state vertexes are, are open sets, even if they don't have any actual semantic meaning that has anything to do with geometry. You know? and, but, uh, sorry, St Stephen, can I just mention one thing, which is that you, you actually do know about this because we discussed it in the context of the multi-way continuum limit and projective Hilbert spaces, right? You remember when you found this, this notion of continuous geometry, that, you know, this, this von Neumann construction of the projective, of, of like a projective Hilbert space purely in terms of a modular lattice. Yes. And th this is exactly that idea, right? So the, the sense in which you, you have a correspondence between a modular lattice and a projective Hilbert space is exactly the sense that Fabrizio said, that the, 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 the combinatorial structure of the modular lattice tells you about the relationships between the subsets of the Hilbert space without actually having to tell you about the individual vectors in that Hilbert space. Okay. Okay, so wait a minute. So this is, you're saying you can map out, I mean, when you're talking about sets, it's a sort of a discrete, almost combinatorial thing. And you're saying you can talk about relationships between sets without ever thinking about the underlying. So, so I mean, what's interesting about that, and maybe that's what you were basically saying is, what we have in our systems is that description of the relationship between what you're describing as being like open sets. And so then the question is, does that sit on top of some continuum thing? I mean, the, the, you're saying there could be a continuum thing of which our system is the open set description, so to speak. Yes, exactly. So what I'm saying is, yes, is, is there a sufficiently generalized notion of topology for which these things behave like they were the open sets and we have a notion, I mean, after you have a topology, then you can define the notion of continuum mapping, continuum function, continuous function uh, over this topological space. Okay, and so what, what is for us, given this idea that the open sets are the nodes of this graph, what is the notion of continuity then? Well, the point is, uh, Thinking about open sets uh, strictly is a bit misleading because what the Grettendieck uh, topology uh, does for you is that it states things in terms of open coverings. So all these choice of sieves and stuff gives you the equivalent of an open covering for topological space. So the first thing to do would be let's describe continuous functions in terms of open coverings and not in terms of open sets. Um, that would be the first step. I'm but sure this is a being worked out. <laughs> on, on this multi-way graph, a function means you assign a value, for example, to every node in the multi-way graph. Yes, that would be a way you of... are mapping these, these vertexes to something, basically, yes. Right, so we assign a value to every vertex. Yeah. So then a continuous function might be, well, what would be an example of, of how we might define a continuous function? If, if we're doing that, what is a continuous function then? 
Um, to use the definition which says that a continuous function pulls back open sets to open sets. That's actually nice, yes. So if you have two of these graphs, like the one I'm seeing right now on the screen, and you have a mapping sending vertices of one to vertices of another one, and if we think of the vertices as open sets, then you want to pull back open sets to open sets. And Oh, well, actually here, the correct notion of open sets would be not a single vertex, but the whole set of vertices and edges going and arriving to the set. Just the yeah, uh, upward yeah. closure of that uh, vertex. Right, right. Because the, 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 the motivation, the motivation that we, that we, sorry, the motivation we started with was to, to try to think of, of motopy in this context. So it was like, what are continuous deformations of paths look like, right? Um, are we at a point where we can think about that? Or, because that's something that genuine, I think is like super interesting. Like what, you know, what um, what what two paths are close to each other and which paths are close to each other and which aren't? Um, can we answer that question? Or Actually, I, I want to make a, a, a suggestion yeah. here. So we've got this idea of branchial graphs which is a way of deciding which, uh, that's a way of deciding which nodes are close to which nodes. We could imagine a similar kind of thing that is asking for the paths, which path is close to which other path in the same kind of construction. So a branchial graph is constructed by taking the each, I mean, like, like I could take the branchial graph here by saying which, which nodes here are related by being the successors of a common ancestor, okay? Mm -hmm. So I would say that the, the analogous thing would be, if you want to know which paths are nearby, we could imagine doing the same thing for paths. We could imagine making a branchial graph with respect to paths, and we, we keep on talking about that. Jonathan, do you have any comments on that? Is that, is that obviously silly? I mean, in other words, we can get a map let me, let me take an example that's more interesting than this one. What's, what's a good example? Let's see. Um, uh, just, just try to get an example of, of something which would turn into a reasonable branchial graph. Um, hold on one second, I'll pick one up. But no, I mean, I, I, I agree that that's obviously something that's worth constructing because, um, yeah, I mean, once you have the interpretation, I mean, the, the topological interpretation of a path as, some param as, a, as effectively a parameterized family of vertex in components, and then you're asking whether those, you know, whether the open sets on one on one in one such family map onto open sets in the other such family, um, then yeah, then then you definitely have a notion of uh, being able to define, you know, path distance. So let's talk about that. I think this is very interesting. Okay, so let's just explain to the folks here what a branchial graph is because it's relevant. Um, okay, so this is, let me. This is a multi-way system. Let's see. Let's let's just draw this multi-way system. It's kind of silly complicated thing here. So we've got a multi-way system. This is a very trivial multi-way system. Let's say four steps um, and let's draw the states graph here. Okay, so this states graph, oh, I have to make it wider, sorry, let's do that. So let's look at the states graph. This is saying, um, these two states here, or let, let's take these two states here, right? Have a common ancestor here, right? So that, that means, so our rule for making a branchial graph is uh, join two states in the branchial graph if they have an immediate common ancestor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those two states have a common ancestor. Let's say these two states have a common ancestor. These two states have a common ancestor. So now let's make the branchial graph Let's make the, the um, one, two, three, four, um, three-step branchial graph. Okay, so that three-step branchial graph should be a map of basically this level of the multi-way graph. Okay, it's saying, how do these states relate to each other? Those two states there, quadruple A, triple B, quadruple A, triple B, relates to triple A, B, A, B, B um, by being joined to, to that because they have a common ancestor. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so this is a way of, so now what you guys are saying, so this is a way of relating states by looking at their common ancestry. Now, what you effectively seem to be talking about is, is there similarly a way to relate paths here to each other, right? So that's the homotopy question would be, is there, what is, which paths? So in, in this picture, we are saying, what's the distance between this thing, triple that thing and that thing? We say it's branchial distance two, okay? So in quantum mechanics, the interpretation of this is this is the map of entanglements between states. And this is telling us that the entanglement distance between these two states is two in this case. Okay, so that's the interpretation. Which would be so a course approximation to the ADM gauge distance. Okay, that was what I was about to ask, is what's the physical interpretation? Okay, so let me, let me understand what you're saying. So the ADM each, gauge... Each such path is a, cho is a choice of foliation which we can parameterize in ADM, right? Is it a choice of foliation? Is it, is that, is it enough? Is it, is it big enough to be a, each such choice of path? Wait a minute. Isn't a foliation a family? Oh, I see. Each path in the multi-way graph is a particular foliation. Yes. yes. Or you can represent as a particular foliation. So then you're asking what is effectively the distance between two foliations. And so my conjecture is that what you're going to end up with is a coarse approximation to the, to the gauge distance. That is the, 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 the total lapse distance and the total shift distance between those two choices of gauge. How do you measure in the ADM formalism? How do you measure the distance between? Okay, so a choice of gauge. Well, that's I mean, just... that's, that's what the ADM formalism is, or that's what, okay, to be more precise, that's what my discrete generalization of the ADM formalism does. It, it tells you, uh, you know, you, you have a hypersurface, the way you can parameterize how you get to the next hypersurface is for it, every point on that hypersurface, you say, what's the time-like distance between that point and its corresponding point? I.e., What's the number of causal edges you have to traverse? And then what's the space-like distance? I.e., What's the combinatorial hypergraph distance between the place where that updating event got applied and the place where the next updating event got applied. And so as yes. long as you define those two quantities for every, for every event, that completely determines the foliation of the causal network. Um, so then if you're given two foliations, you can ask about what's the, what's the total uh, lapse distance and shift distance, i.e. the total time-like distance and the total um, spatial distance uh, you know, uh, uh, constructed, say, as a volume average over that, over that entire causal network. And that gives you effectively a wave. To, uh, that gives you a metric on the space of possible gauges. And then I think basically what we're doing here is constructing a course approximation to that metric. Okay, let's try and unravel this for other people for a second. Okay, so the ADM formalism. So we have a differential equation, a PDE, the Einstein equations, let's say, and we are effectively trying to solve it as an, as an initial value problem. So we're taking one space-like hypersurface, which is one simultaneous surface, and we're trying to figure out. What are the values of the of uh, you know parameters curvature whatever else on a subsequent space like hypersurface correct right and and then what we're asking is there are many choices of our foliation of the space in terms of space like hypersurfaces and what Jonathan is saying you can parameterize those different sets of choices by at every point giving a a, a lapse function and a shift vector a lapse function being how far how far down in time you're going to get to the next space like hypersurface, a shift vector being how far across in space you're going from every point, right? Okay, so now we've got this, this family of surfaces, which is, corresponds to one possible ADM sequence, so to speak. We've got another family of surfaces corresponding to another ADM, family, ADM sequence. Now you're saying there is a distance metric between those two families but I didn't quite understand how you define that distance metric. Well, if, if you take the, say, the initial hypersurface in family one and the initial hypersurface in family two, you can overlay them on top of each other and you can define, now, of course, your, problem, your conditions of global hyperbolicity that you have in the standard ADM of formalism go away because those hypersurfaces obviously will intersect with each other. Um, but then you can still define a lapse and a gauge. Admittedly, the lapse might be negative, uh, which would obviously not be allowed in the conventional formulation, but which we can allow here. And so you can take a, an, an overall uh, you, you can compute the overall lapse and shift distance between those two hypersurfaces that are the sort of that they, they are they are two different hypersurfaces for the same okay value I, I of the so what you're saying is the faux evolution instead of a genuine evolution from hypersurface in model one to hypersurface in model two it's a fake evolution that just says use the same formalism 
to make the comparison between these two hypersurfaces. Exactly, exactly. So, so, or in other words, rather than comparing hypersurfaces at two different values of the universal time function, you're comparing hypersurfaces for the same value of the universal time function, which is yes, not normally how you do Yes, two different models. You're comparing- yeah, two, 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 two different foliations, yes. Right. Are, aren't you de facto defining a sheaf in doing something similar? Because it seems to me that what you're trying to do is saying, I map some of these things to some stuff. And if they, these mappings overlap somewhere, I can lift this to a mapping on the union of the two things that overlap. Did I understand this correctly? Or? Uh, that doesn't sound completely wrong. It's not the way I think about it, but um, yeah, sorry, continue. Yeah. But, so, I mean, go, go ahead. I mean, uh, th this corresponds with sheaves. I've never understood sheaves. So, so we're... we're um, I can give you an easy example of what a sheaf is. Um, let me try to do this, this trick here a second. I'm trying to switch my camera. Now you should be seeing my hands. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yep. very nice. uh, oh, great. I'm great. not great. Uh, technological, unfortunately, so I'm using a very <laughs> analog way of doing things. So the idea but of a sheaf... At least you're left-handed. All the cool people are left-handed. Thank you. Yes, I am left-handed. Um, <laughs> so imagine that this is my space. It's literally like a plane and nothing more. And now I want to attach some sort of information to regions of the plane. So for instance, I can have this region here. And to this, I want to attach a set of things. Um, Again, it doesn't matter uh, what these things are. This could be, for instance, the set of continuous functions defined on this thing. Yes, actually, let's do the example with continuous functions. This is a nice example. Uh, I have my space, and I take this region here, and to this I attach the set of continuous functions on, on, on this region, okay? Now, you see that I can take a subregion here and attach a set of continuous function like this. And now what I have is that this thing is included in this thing. And here things are counter variant. Like I can take any continuous function in here and map it to its restriction in this small thing. Are you following me up to here? I think so. So the idea is that in category theory, this is, I have a base category called C, which is open sets, called this U, called this V, for instance, ordered by inclusion. So for instance, I have an inclusion of U into V, and this thing is mapped to set contravariantly, which means that if U goes into V, then, continuous functions on U. Um, yeah, sorry, continuous yeah. functions on V map to continuous functions on yeah. U via restriction. Cool. Now, what a shift tells me is that this assignment is consistent, uh, which means basically um, two things. Uh, the first thing is that um, there is an overlapping condition. Uh, let me change. So the overlapping condition says this. Imagine I have this situation here. I have this small region and these big ones. Now, for what we have said, uh, since this is included in these two, I have two mappings like this, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the idea is that, um, let me see, uh, actually, I think I need UJ, yes. Um, basically, the idea is that if these two things agree on the overlap, I can glue them together. So from, this definition and this definition, I can basically see where these two things are sent and then get a unique assignment of this whole thing. 
Um, let, let me give you a um, one dimensional example because it's probably easier. Let's imagine that this is the real line. Uh, and you know, I have continuous functions here. Um, to each open set, I can basically map the continuous functions um, all defined on this open set. Now, clearly, if I have two open overlapping open sets and two continuous functions agree on the overlapping, then I can find a big continuous function defined on the union by just gluing them together. Yes. This is Very analogous to the kind of sort of to the charts in an atlas construction for, for the yeah, in, in, in similar fact, sort of flavor. In fact, uh, all these um, stuff done in algebraic topology and differential geometry can be recasted in terms of sheaves. There is actually a correspondence between sheaves and bundles. Um, so, you know, that's, that's basically... Okay, where's the sheaf? So far, we've, we've just got um, correspondences between things like charts. Where's the sheaf? The sheaf is basically this correspondence. So given a category C that represents your base space, um, a sheaf is just an assignment to set. So again, this, this means that to each region, I attach a set of things. And every time I have uh, an, in, an, an inclusion here, this corresponds to a restriction here, so that this gluing condition holds, and moreover, there's um, a local condition. That means that if two assignments uh, agree on each open set of an open covering, then they also agree on the whole set they cover. So this means that the information is defined locally. If two things agree locally everywhere, then they have to agree on the whole thing. Um, this is not like a super clean and nice way to say it, but the idea is that this is a particular kind of sheaf uh, in which I am attaching this. This is a functor to set, and the idea is that to each object I'm attaching, I don't know, continuous functions, and uh, to injections I'm mapping restrictions. But you know, I could I could do things more generally. I could say to this region, I literally attach a set of things. And to this other region, I attach another set of things. And now if I have an inclusion here, I will just have a function here of some sort. Um, so yeah, for instance, in algebraic geometry, people attach to these things uh, rings or a billion groups, or I mean, you name it, basically any kind of stuff you want. Um, so and what is the correspondence here? So, so Jonathan, you, you, you're talking about the mapping between foliations, basically. Yes. What and, would and, be the correspondence to this? Well, I mean, it's, so foliations of, a, of, of arbitrary space-time can be represented in terms of sheaf cohomology classes. Explain. <laughs> uh, I, which which part? I mean, you you have so you have some topological manifold, right? You can can you can construct say a C, you can think of a foliation of that manifold as being like a CW complex, or something, yes. right? And the and and you can define. I think, in fact, I don't, you don't even need to use sheaf cohomology. You can use catch cohomology. I think in 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 most cases, at least if the if the space is para compact, I think they're the same. Um, that so so at least locally, you can define that simplicial decomposition in terms of a, in, in terms of a sheaf cohomology. Which simplicial decomposition? The one, the one. Wait a minute, where's there a simplicial decomposition? There's, as I say, you, you you take a manifold, you, you you construct a CW complex. Okay. And the way you can define that locally is in terms of sheaf cohomology. Is it probably uh, useful to explain at least the idea behind cohomology? I don't know. Or everyone is I sort of mind. thought I understood, but you you're welcome to try to explain it if you have a nice clear. Uh, yes. Uh, so. Uh, uh, okay, in, in this case, uh, I was telling you, imagine that this is an open set U and this is an open covering, okay? The shift conditions um, I was telling about is that basically if I have two assignments from U to something else and they agree on each one of these open sets that cover U, they have to agree on the whole U. And the other one is that if they agree on all the overlaps, 
if I have basically something defined on all these possible overlaps, then I should be able to get a big thing. These are called the local condition and the gluing condition for a sheaf. Now, I could also have an assignment CIOP set, which fails to be a sheaf. So I don't know, maybe, you know, you don't, you can't have a local set, um, uh, you, you can't probably, I don't know, um, glue things together or, you know, you fail to lift something that is defined locally to something that is defined globally. Um, a stupid example I could give is this. Imagine that I have this kind of space here, which is just a thing where I can walk on. And, and to each point of this space, I give to assignment of some sort. And now I'm saying, okay, I'm mapping this year, this year, this year, and this year. When you express this in shift theoretic terms, you see that the gluing condition fails. I mean, it's not important now to understand precisely why, but the idea is that you can have this thing. I mean, you can intuitively see like that a Mobius thing... strip is a good is a good kind of like thing visual metaphor, right? Uh, probably, I, I, but the, a Mobius strip should be a consistent assignment. Like a case, right? Hmm? Say again. Should be like more a Penrose staircase. Yes, right. exactly. Yes. Yes. Like you know, you can say you can say yes. Imagine that. Imagine that this is a right example. Imagine that this is actually Escher's uh, stairs. You know, and to each point you're attaching the following information: Am I going up or am I going down? And then you can say, okay, I'm going up and going up and going up and going up, but wait, why am I still where I am? So, you know, you are not able to lift this to a global section. As you walk on the, on the stairs, it always seems like locally everything is going all right, but when you zoom globally, this is an impossible figure. Now, the point of cohomology is that when this shift in, I mean, cohomology is a super big field, but in this case, you can ask, why is this thing failing to be a sheaf? And what cohomology does is it gives you a qualitative understanding of what are the obstructions uh, to obtain a sheaf. Let me give another example. Uh, the most standard example of cohomology group in a classic setting is, you know, just um, the group um, the fundamental group of a space. So imagine that I have uh, a donut, so a torus, basically. Oh, I'm super bad at drawing this stuff, forgive me, but I, I have this thing here that is supposed to be a torus. Uh, and I can ask, can I contract this thing to a ball, can, to a point? Can I contract it to a point, and the, the answer is we know is not, because this thing is not homotopically equivalent to a sphere. What cohomology does is it says, I map each one of these topological spaces to a groupoid, actually, or if you choose a particular point on the, on the space to a group, and if this group is trivial, then I know that this thing doesn't have any like hole or whatever, but if the group is not trivial, then I know that this thing will not will, will have some holes in it that will basically not allow me to contract it to a point. And right. so I mean, basically this is the group of where the operation is paths, you're taking elements which are paths on the on the space yes. and your operation is, is appending those paths. And so yes, on. exactly. And so in this case, I can say, oh, the first cohomology group of this space is actually the fundamental group. And, oh, if this is trivial, then I have no obstructions. I can just contract this thing to a point and I'm happy. If it's not trivial, then I can't. But then I can study using group theory uh, what this group tells me about why I can't. So cohomology is a way to do a quant qualitative analysis of why something that we would like to do fails. And in particular, in, in this case, yeah, I could basically have sheaves and I can say, okay, I want to test these sheaves for some property, or I may have some pre-sheaves that fail to be sheaves and I want to know why. And, you know, I can 
basically use this bag of techniques that go under the name of cohomology, because cohomology is not really one thing, to basically associate these things to other algebraic objects so that, uh, you know, things work out uh, and tell me why so, I can't do Yeah, so, so just a question here, partly for Jonathan, is what is the analog of cohomology for our systems? Well, I mean, that's what I was saying, right? So if, if, you, th if you think about a, a choice of foliation as being a cochain complex or something, right, then, then, the, then, the, then the class of, of permissible, you know, every, every choice of lapse function and shift vector is locally fine. It's just that some of them globally conflict because they lead to violations of the causal partial order. So, you, so, so that there are certain kinds of cochains that are simply not permissible because they have non-trivial first cohomology or second cohomology or whatever. And so, so, so the, the way you can kind of parameterize the set of permissible, trans, uh, of permissible foliations of a space in this context is through something like sheaf cohomology. Okay, so that's very interesting. So let's oh, and by, by the way, sorry, just, just to add something to, to the, point, the point that Tali and Matteo made. Uh, so if, if you want to think about the Penrose uh, tri-bar, right? So if, if you consider the group of all, I guess the group of all distances from which you could view the, or, uh, yeah, the group of all distances from which you could view the tri-bar, then, uh, th then the statement that the tri bar is a kind of impossible object corresponds exactly to the statement that it has a non-trivial element of the of that the if you consider the cohomology of an annulus, which is kind of what the tri bar is constructed from, right? Then it, then then the statement that the tri bar can't be globally constructed corresponds to the statement that it has a non-trivial element in its first cohomology. Yeah. Okay. Remind me. Now I'm confused. What is the what is the second? What, what's the? What's the? Is it like homotopy? The first, and second cohomology. I, I, I should know this. Yeah, the know. first cohomology group is, if I'm not wrong, is basically the fundamental group. Uh, oh, so I'm, I'm a little confused by something. So the description you gave felt like it was a description of homology rather than cohomology, and I know that they're related, but it wasn't, it wasn't clear in the example how to switch to thinking about cohomology? Because I know it's like co-chain complexes, Jonathan, you, you mentioned that. How do we think about this in the context of causal? Maybe it would be good also to not be too abstract and to think in, in terms of multi-way systems. Well, uh, yeah, if I'm not wrong, actually, maybe Matteo knows more than me in this, but the first cohomology group for topological spaces should correspond to the fundamental group of the space. It's the, abel um, it's the abelianization of the first fundamental yeah. group. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry. I was I was not paying attention because somebody sent an interesting thing through on a on a uh, live stream chat. Um, sorry. So say so the whose paper is this? Uh, maybe this I is a know. paper. Um, oh, is Michael? I love Michael Robinson. I've met him at uh, NIST a couple of years ago, and he's actually the person that made the sheaves click for me. I've always thought I was too stupid to understand what a shift was until I saw one of his talks and I will be always grateful to him for this because it really is the guy that made it click for me. So uh, I will be always grateful to you if you can remember what that what that talk is because a YouTube uh, video would be much appreciated. Let me see if I can find it but in general the reason why Michael is so nice is because he uses shift theory to do um, that analysis. So it can really give you very practical examples of how, how this stuff works. I, I remember it was giving me these examples. Imagine that um, you are standing up with a camera and you are taking pictures who are going in circle. Uh, in, like you move circularly, um, you turn around basically and you take pictures. Now, um, Imagine that someone, when, when you take the pictures, there's someone in one picture, but when you are back to that place, that someone went away. Now you can, you have all these pictures that, you know, they overlap perfectly, uh, singularly, but then, you know, they spiral out basically. And, and at some point you have an inconsistency because you are expecting to find a person and to complete a, a ring of pictures basically, but that person is not there anymore. And so, now you have two pictures there that are incompatible. And then you can use shift theory to make sense of this kind of stuff and how to obtain a global section if you can. So it, 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 the, the idea that he had is I have a base space that is telling me how data are organized and I'm 
basically organizing data using sheaves. So that to each point of this base space, I attach some kind of information and then I can use all these machinery to basically um, present this data nicely. Which so is which thing in, in your description, you know, Microsoft used to have this whole product. I can't remember what it was called. The thing where they would stitch together pictures to get a- Photosynth, um, I remember that, yeah. yeah. I don't know what happened to that, but anyway, maybe it became a generic technology, but, but um, uh, okay. So you're doing your Photosynth thing where you're taking it from all angles and you're trying to reconstruct the, the 360 picture, but something went wrong in time as you did that. So where's the sheaf? What, what piece of the story is? So what is basically the to each point, uh, actually in this case, you are going in circles. So your topological space is, um, you have your open sets that are the portions of angle you see. Okay, so yep. like, and, and basically to each, yeah. to each one of this portion, you can attach all the pictures that include that angle of vision in it restricted to it. So um, maybe I'm taking a picture of the wall in front of me. My view cone is, I don't know, 90 degrees. So I take this picture. Now, if I take the cone that is 45 degrees, I just restrict this picture accordingly. And so to each one of these open sets, I can attach all the, the set of all the pictures that include this thing and um, again, when I restrict my view, angle view, I restrict the pictures accordingly. And this is exactly the kind of example I was drawing before with, uh, with the circles on the plane. It's really the kind, same kind of thing. It's just that now my set is not the set of continuous functions, but the set of pictures that depict okay. uh, the, the information. Right. So, so what is the analog? Uh, maybe Jonathan, what, what's the analog for us of that story? Of, of, of what story? Uh, well, for example, the photosynth story. Yeah. I think the analog of that is that each possible, each picture that was taken is some slice in the foliation somehow. Well, it, it, it's a local choice of gauge. And the statement that you can't, it's, it's like any other cohomology story, isn't it? It's, it's a statement that you, you have a bunch of local choices of gauge, but they may or may not add up to make a complete panorama. They may or may not end up be, you know, corresponding to a valid global choice of gauge. Okay. But so, so okay, but, but, but the original question here with respect to cohomology of these things right. is we've got these paths in the multiway graph and we're asking is there some topological obstruction to moving from one path in the multiway graph to another path in the multiway graph? How do you even move between paths? What is the deformation of a path? I feel like it should be something very simple that just pops out at us if we just think about it a little bit. Right. Because it yeah, has so to be in reference so to the rules, right? So it's a foliation transformation and the topological obstructions are precisely those local choices of gauge that result in failure of global hyperbolic. Okay, so this is exactly the thing I've been trying to understand for several months now, is this thing about the space of foliations. I mean, this, this to me seemed like the thing that might come out of, you know, thinking in category theory-ish terms and so on, is how do you, what, what does it mean? Okay, what is the family of possible foliations? And how do you move between foliations? And you're saying, if we look at the space of all possible foliations, that there can be, I mean, in the trivial case, right? Where, let's look at Minkowski space, for example. In Minkowski space, okay, let, let's say Minkowski space for, uh, we're looking at inertial frames in Minkowski space. We've got a very trivial collection of possible families of foliations, right? And there is no topological obstruction in moving from one inertial frame to another, if I'm understanding correctly. No, but there's a topological obstruction in the sense that well, okay, in, in this particular case, okay, you've, you've picked the one case in which cohomology doesn't help you because, because the local <laughs> choice of gauge determines the global choice of gauge for yeah. an inertial frame. That's the definition of an inertial frame. But for anything other than an inertial frame, um, no, just knowing the local choice of gauge doesn't tell you enough, right? You, you generally need all of the information about local choices of gauges to determine whether that's, a, whether that's a globally valid choice of gauge, because you need to be able to determine if it's consistent with the causal partial okay, order. So, so let's understand what you mean by that. By local choice of gauge, you mean a coordinatization, a space-time coordinatization, basically. Right, a, a local coordinate patch, as, as Tali was kind of alluding to. 
Right, okay, so we've got for anything other than the trivial case of an inertial frame, for anything where there's non-trivial curvature, for example, or any coordinate system that isn't just a flat coordinate system, we've got all these local choices of coordinates. Okay, so now you're asking, as we transform from one, and, and I'm also confused by another thing. What is the, what is the uh, in, a, in a fiber bundle, for example, we would also have a local choice of coordinate system. And then we have this notion of a connection that tells us different, you know, how we move from different local patches. Is that, is that, but in, in this case, we've just got a bunch of local patches that we are setting up and we've got another bunch of local patches that corresponds to another coordinates for another foliation. And you're asking, right. when right. can so, we- so, so obviously the, the, in, in the, again, the details of this are in the general relativity paper, but so, so the, our analog of the notion of a connection is a, is, is a collection of weightings of, of, each, of, of the hyper edges or causal edges that exist in our networks, right? So, uh, the, you know, the, the default choice of the levi civita connection that you'd make in general relativity corresponds to the statement that everything has unit weight. And so in particular, if you have an edge that's connecting, you know, vertices U and V, then you also have an edge connecting vertex, vertices V and U, and the, 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 those have, a, have exactly the same weight. But if you relax that condition, then you can allow for more general types of connections. And in particular, you can allow for torsion metrics and, and things like that. And Where, so, which page do I go to, Jonathan, to have, give me a chance to? Oh, uh, it's late on. Hang on, let me find that. Um, so it's somewhere. It's it's in the place where I define Riemann curvature on hypergraphs. Um, open sets. You're talking about open sets here. Um, Oh yeah, okay. If you look at page uh, pages twenty nine to thirty, what the heck is this? I didn't know you put this. Is this the, is this the arbitrary dimensional version of um of the uh, Robertson Walker metric? Uh, yes. Oh, good. I didn't know you had. That. You 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 told me to put that in. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought it was a good idea. I didn't know you'd done it. So... Uh, anyway, sorry. Pages twenty nine to thirty. Okay. So if you look here, um, okay, so at the bottom there, in the definition of the, the one Wasserstein distance, so we have this parameter epsilon. So the epsilon is, is a coupling parameter that um, you can think of as being the elementary weight that you're assigning to each hyperedge. And so later on, I state that we're, you know, we're particularly considering the case where, where epsilon is, is, has, has a value of unity for, every, you know, for everything. Um, yeah, in which each hyperedge is assumed to correspond effectively to a, a unit of spatial distance. But you could have considered, so in that case, you, you're, then you could have hyperedges that had different values, go, you know, depending on which way I you understand. traverse. So then you, you have, have torsion metric metrics. Torsion. So, so yeah. you, you can actually define, it turns out in the continuum limit, you can define arbitrary connections this way. Okay, but, but so again, we're trying to figure out, so, okay, why do we care about this? So one reason we care is because what we're talking about is transformations between possible reference frames, which I claim, although nobody, well, I don't know whether anybody believes me yet, that this is going to be important for distributed computing and thinking about that. That this idea of, of what the possible uh, you know, reference frame choices are is going to be important. But you're saying, what is the obstruction to moving continuously from one choice of one family of reference frames to another? What What is the... What's the physics? What's the general relativity version of saying there's a topological obstruction? So, so that that would be the statement that if you you know if you, if you have two space like hyper you know you you have two levels two possible level sets corresponding to two different choices of universal time function, and you want to construct a you you want to construct a continuous deformation from one to the other. Um, there will be certain classes of hypersurfaces for which even though the two, even though the start and end points, the, the, the initial and final hypersurfaces are both consistent with the, with the partial order of the Lorentzian manifold, uh, so there are intermediate ones which, which are not. I so that would correspond to a topological obstruction. Okay, but so what is that physically? So you're saying- I, do, I don't have a good answer. Well, let's think about it for a second. I mean, so you've got, you've got two choices of, 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 of reference frames, two choices of, of um, and you're saying, I mean, as you move between these, as you make a deformation of the coordinate system to move between these choices of reference frames, you hit something that is not, 
Okay, here's, here's a trivial example, right? So if you consider, imagine a universe with a cosmic event horizon. Yes. And you have an observer in one part of the, in one side of this cosmic event horizon and an observer in the other side, right? They, they have different reference frames that are just naturally defined by the expansion of the universe. But there is a topological obstruction that prevents you from transforming from one to the other that is the cosmic event horizon. Okay. But this is going to be a more general, so th this notion exactly. of cosmology, go ahead. No, I'm, saying, I'm, I'm agreeing. I mean, it, it is, it's exciting precisely because it, it, you know, the cosmic event horizon is an obvious topological obstruction, but there may be very non-obvious topological obstructions that we, we don't know about. And, um, and what it means when there's a topological obstruction is that this choice of reference frame, which we are thinking is related to these choice of, sh that, that can be thought of as a sheaf, um, a choice of these sheaves, that there exists a a way of essentially breaking the space of all possible choices of reference frames, discreetly breaking that because of these topological obstructions. So we can essentially classify the sort of equivalence classes or something, the, the sort of continuously deformable groups of, of reference frames from the other ones. So physically, gosh, what on earth is that physically? I mean, that is, what is that? What does it mean when there are two well, like, for example, let's take the Schwarzschild black hole, for example. Are there, when you look at different choices of coordinates, whether it's, you know, crystal coordinates or this coordinate or that coordinate, do you see things like this happen there? Is it, is it continuously deformable from the original Schwarzschild coordinates to some more modern coordinate system for the Schwarzschild black hole? Well, no. I mean, so, so for instance, if you go from, say, um, okay, uh, the particular case that I think is probably most illustrative, if you attempted to go continuously from the Schwarzschild metric to say the goldstrand panleve metric, then because of the existence of the coordinate singularity, there isn't a, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a topological defect in your coordinate system. So there isn't a smooth, you know, obviously if you, if you get rid of the coordinate singularity, then, then you can make a smooth transition between the two, but otherwise you can't because the coordinate singularity has to go somewhere. Okay. So the, but the existence of the coordinate singularity, I mean, I thought that was a special feature of, of a bad coordinate system, that it had a coordinate. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that, that's why the Schwarzschild coordinate system is not a good one if you're actually interested in black holes. So right? let, let's take an example on the sphere. Can we get an example on the sphere? Where there's, I mean, there's plenty of coordinate systems on the sphere that have all kinds of crazy singularities. So if you're asking for different coordinate systems, you're asking... Well, it's, it's it's like asking, can you can you map from like the I I, I what would it, what is the Riemann sphere projection on? Is that the Mercator projection? I forget the Mercator map projection. projection. I forget the map projection terminology. But you know, but if you no, it's not. It's it's a it's a Lambert as Lambert, in, as in Lambert. Lambert, isn't it? Isn't it? Okay, a, okay. But if you wanted to go from you, you know from... A, a polar coordinate system to something that's like given by projections on the Riemann sphere, then you're going to be in trouble. There's a okay, so within map projections, you're saying that there isn't, for some map projections, there's a continuous deformation from one map projection to another. Like, so, I mean, if I take, let's just take a random collection. Let's, let's take, this is, this is a, a guaranteed dangerous thing to do, but let's take a random sample of 10 map projections just for the sake of, um, oh, I bet half of these are not going to work. But anyway, um, uh, let's say we say something like, um, this is really a horrifying thing to do. Let's see whether this even, even vaguely works. But, but so you're, you're talking about, I mean, I'm just trying to be concrete, talking about map projections. Um, wow, why is this so slow? Maybe the, I have a bad feeling these SPC map projections are something really weird that um, some kind of I empirical think, projections. These are only coordinate charts. Oh, drat, look at that. Well, let's see. Um, let's just try this. Ag. Oh, that's the wrong thing. 226. I think they're not, um, uh, what am I trying to do here? Um, oh, I know what I want to say. Sorry, I just, I just want to make something where we can actually recognize what's going on. I 
I mean, we can see something is happening between these map projections just on that intersection. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here are some map projections. All right, so what you're saying is, there's some pretty funky map projections here, but you're saying that some map projections will have the property that we can continuously get from one, let's say from that guy to this guy, maybe. But other map projections like this crazy creature here, um, we may not, so I don't even know what characterizes one we can get from one to another continuously. That may be a piece of math I should know. But is, is that what you're talking about basically? Is when, when is it the case that there is right, a continuous right. I mean, deformation? I, yeah, I, I don't know enough about map projections to know the answer to that particular question. But so in, in the case of GR, as I say, if, if you want to map say from Goldstrand Pandavi coordinates to Schwarzschild coordinates, you run into this problem of, you know, by definition, the, sing the coordinate singularity is a discontinuity. And so locally around, in, in the region where that, singular, where that coordinate singularity should be, appear, sh should be appearing, the mapping from one coordinate system to the other necessarily becomes discontinuous in that neighborhood. Right. The, um, right. Hey, we should wrap up soon. It's getting really late for everybody. Um, the, uh, um, well, this is very interesting. All right, so, so what to, just, just zooming out and trying to summarize a little bit. So we, I'm, I'm still a little, you know, this whole question about how does category theory help us and what is the correspondence between what we're talking about in category theory? We're sort of slowly, you know, circling around, getting closer to, that, to the answer to that question. Um, and uh, you've raised a number of interesting things about, I mean, I, I think I'm beginning to feel a little bit more confident about saying something about this notion of mapping between coordinate, but between reference frames. Um, or between, between foliations, but I don't think we really understand that yet. Um, I think you've mentioned, we, we've talked a little bit about the specifics of things like even Petri nets and their representation of, of, um, uh, of distributed, you know, dis, dis, the analog of distributed computation. Um, I, mean, I don't know, this has, been, this has been a complicated discussion. And I, I, I also, I didn't really get my answer to how do I think about the infinity category? I mean, I, I'm, do, I, do I have one more chance to try to understand what the, you know, how should I think about it? I mean, it's like you, you keep on, you know, like let's say, let's say an automated theorem proving, you keep on talking about the correspondence between the correspondence between. Okay, let, let, me, let me give uh, another um, point of view, which may, probably help. Um, there is a notion of um, higher category, which is called bi-category. Um, the idea is that in category theory, we require that, you know, composition of morphisms is associative, for instance, uh, and the identity laws hold up to equality. But as soon as you introduce also higher morphisms, so morphisms between morphisms, you see that you can relax this. So you can say, instead of A circle B circle C uh, equals A circle B circle C, so the associative thing, you say, actually, I want them to be isomorphic. And isomorphic in this case means that there are a couple of morphisms between morphisms that are one the inverse of the other. So that's, that's connected to the idea I was uh, telling you before that you can think about higher categories as uh, a weakening of standard category theory. Like we have a standard category and now we have weakened the definition because instead of having an equality, we require this to hold up to isomorphism. But then I can do the same kind of trick. I can consider the composition of morphisms between morphisms. Uh, and I can ask, um, should this be hold up to equality or up to isomorphism and blah, blah, blah. And that's why if you keep inductively doing this kind of thing, then what you get is an infinity category uh, where basically everything is super weak. And, um, and this is uh, connected to 
type theory because the real difference in here between having an equality and having um, like you, you draw here um, a, an isomorphism is that an isomorphism is a kind of constructive kind of thing. Like you really want to give a function, a, a morphism, you want to construct it that testifies that these things are this sort of weak associativity. So in this sense, it's like the most proof relevant version of a category you can think about where it, you, you can't just say, oh, uh, I go from, a, from F, um, from A, B, C to A, B, C, but I also have to specify how I go there. And if I specify two different ways to do so in two different contexts, then I have to specify a way to go from one to the other all the way up to infinity. I don't know if this clarifies things or actually makes it more complicated. No, I, I just don't have an intuition. I mean, it, to me, it would be very useful to understand, you know, we've got proofs, we've got correspondence between proofs, mm -hmm. and then we go on with that process. So, so, so Stephen, if, so, so um, imagine, Imagine you had a version of fine equational proof where you, you, you feed in a, a theorem of the form proof object equals equals proof object. Yep. Right? But those proof objects are themselves proofs of equivalences between proofs and, and so on. That, that, you know, that they are the, the individual substitution lemmas are not substitution lemmas on expressions, but substitution lemmas on rewrite rules that yep. are themselves proofs of other substitution lemmas. So yep. Right. So the, the point that Fabrizio, I think, is making is that um, the, the, the kind of the, the, the highest level of generalization of that is one in which Proving that the two proof objects are equivalent also proves that the proof objects, and if each of those proof objects is itself a proof that two proof objects are equivalent, proving that the first two proof objects are equivalent also proves that the proof objects contained within them are equivalent, and that the proof objects contained within those are equivalent, and so on. So it's 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 a great weakening of the of the of the otherwise infinite number of equivalences that you would have to prove. You just prove one equivalence, and then it, and then all the ones below, the levels below it kind of cascade down. This, that's the notion of weak homotopy equivalence between uh, between terms in in in. So in what does that mean? For I, I'm still very. I mean, I, I think I. And then and then the, 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 the model for, the the model for that space is the homotopy type is is the is the infinity category of homotopy type. So yeah, you, you imagine this. Maybe this clarifies. I have two terms of type A. Call them P and Q. And now. I can consider proofs that these two things are equal. So where do these proofs leave? Uh, well, these will leave in this type here. This is the type yep, of yep, yep. proofs of these two things. Cool. But then in this thing, I can consider W and W1. And this will be two proofs that these two things are equal. Yep. But then again, I can consider uh, the type of. Sure. And you see, this is already an higher kind of homotopy type. So. Yeah, I, I, I get how this is constructed. I just don't have an intuition for what. I mean. This is P and this is Q. And a proof equals to say that we can go from one to the other. Sure. Now, this thing means that I can deform this thing into the other. And I can have two different ways of deforming these two things, so different homotopies. And now this thing will contain proofs that say that actually these two homotopies are homotopically equivalent. And I can you know, iterate this, this thing up to infinity. It's, it's actually very difficult to visualize, I believe, but... Right, uh, I, I mean, but okay, but so in the physics case, for example, this mm -hmm. is like saying, okay, we've got these actual evolution paths, we've got the causal, uh, causal connections between, between events that happen, we've got the causal connection, we've, we've got the foliations that are connections between yeah. events, and then what do we have beyond that? What do, what do we think well, about? Well, we, we could also not have anything beyond that. Like it's perfectly fine if we just have a three category or a four category or well, a two I understand category. that, but I, I'm just curious if there is an interpretation of going to infinity. 
Well, that, that's what I mean. I think it really depends on your model. I think that what is worth noticing here is that the way we go to infinity is defining things uh, inductively. Like from, sure. from the very beginning, there is a convenient inductive way. So in, in the physics example you make, uh, it feels to me that there is a very big difference um, in how like our zero level things are interpreted, how the first level things are interpreted, because you say, okay, the first thing is causal structures. And the second thing is equivalences of causal structures, which may not themselves be causal structures. So I think that the yeah. asking yeah. if we have an infinity category structure amounts to ask, is there a way to inductively keep going and thinking about relationships and things between things and the answer may as well be no actually i would be way happier if the answer was no because infinity category theory is not the easiest thing in the world so if you can avoid that you and, and well i understand but i okay the, the the thing for me is that understanding these first three levels mm -hmm. you know it it's already it's already kind of um uh, you know, we've already, it's been already interesting to understand these first three levels. And I'm, I'm just have the suspicion. Uh, I don't know, it just maybe it's a piece of aesthetics, so to speak, that there's something to be understood beyond those levels. And maybe, maybe it's, I mean, what what Jonathan is saying is the next level up is the obstruction between deformations between reference frames, basically. Mm -hmm. So, so St Stephen, may maybe the theorem proving example was too abstract, but if so, if you want to think about the same statement in terms of multiway systems, it, it would be you know in an ordinary state graph for for a multiway system, if you have two paths through, through that state graph, if you have just specifications of two paths, and then you define a mapping between those two paths that maps vertices on one path to vertices on the other, edges on one path to edges on the other, the the fact that you can construct that mapping actually doesn't tell you that those two paths are valid paths in the multi-way states graph, right? What do you mean? I thought you said you started with two paths in the, you mean, well, in the mapping. So, yeah, but so, so I, th that's how they're generated. But suppose I just give you, you know, I just give you two paths and I say, you know, the, the, these, are, these are two path graphs and here's a mapping from one to the other. Mm -hmm. From that information, you can't then deduce that those two paths are actually valid paths with respect to the original multi-way system. That's correct. That's equivalent to saying, if I just give you a proof of equivalence between two proofs, that does not in itself tell you that the, that the actual expressions that those things are proving are themselves true, are themselves equivalent. Yes. Right. So if there existed an infinity categorical in, uh, model for, for our sort of physics models, what it would be would be some ultra generalization of the rule of uh, multiway graph in which if you could show that there were, if you could show equivalence between two paths, it would necessarily show equivalences between all paths and all, on all systems of the kind of, of lower levels of abstraction, including in particular equivalences between the actual states at the endpoints. Yes, I understand. That's the kind of thing I'm looking for, right? Yes, because so this is a non-constructive argument, right? <laughs> if such an object exists, that would be its property, but we don't yet know. Well, but I know, but but to say that it's a generalization, it's the it's the ultimate kind of correspondence between description languages in the ruleal graph somehow. That's what you're basically saying. It's some ultimate. <sighs> right. It, it, it's so it's a correspondence. It, it, well, it's a it's a it's a type of equivalence that implies correspondence between equivalent uh, between uh, description languages, correspondence between updating orders correspondence between causal uh, foliations and actually uh, correspondences between individual states as special right. cases of, of whatever this more generalized type of equivalence is. Right. Seems worth looking for. And that seems like the ultimate sort of category theory prize, so to speak, in these, in these models will be to understand that because that's what, you know, in the original dis discussion here about category theory, and using it as a pattern to see different kinds of things. That seems like the, you know, to be able to see that everything we're talking about can be fit into one framework seems useful. I mean, it's just like, I do think that our correspondence between, for example, features of physical space, features of branchial space, features of ruleal space. I mean, the challenge I, I've been mm -hmm. continuing to try to understand what's the, uh, um, 
okay, you want, to, you want to get really weirded out here. It's like, what's a particle? A particle in physical space, we kind of understand what it might be topologically. What's a particle in branchial space? And Jonathan, here's one we haven't talked about yet. What's a particle in ruleal space? I mean, that's, a, that's sort of a, a yet weirder thing. All right, anyway, we should wrap up here. But um, you know, uh, this, was, this was really interesting. And um, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I haven't quite uh, gotten rid of my fear of category theory, but you're-, you're, you're That, you're that making... makes sense. It, it takes, I think it takes years to, that, I mean, uh, it is by far the most difficult thing I ever had to study. And um, basically when I started my PhD, I didn't know anything about category theory. And I was forced to learn it because everyone in my research group was speaking category theory. So I have no choice. But if this wasn't the case, I wouldn't have learned it ever because I find that the most difficult thing in category theory is that it's not enough to understand definitions. It really requires a mind shift. You have to start asking not anymore who are the elements here and what they do, but what are the relationships that this structure has with other structures? And you need to embrace this perspective to be able to give the right definitions. And it's a very difficult thing to do. I, I got to the point where I was understanding all the definitions and I, feel like, I felt like I wasn't understanding anything at all. Um, because, and, and then at some point it clicks. Uh, so yeah, it, I, I think it's not an easy thing. So, so let me ask a more question about this. I mean, you know, in a sense, your description gives me gives me more sympathy because you know I've been working on symbolic languages for forever, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are things there where there are complicated, abstract constructions that are you know functions that construct functions that construct things yep. and so on. And for me, those are pretty easy to understand. But you know, I've I've known about them most of my life, so to speak. So you know, it makes me more sympathetic uh, to people who find it difficult to understand those things, my difficulties in understanding category theory. But if I wanted, I mean, in terms of concretifying category theory, is there, I mean, one of the great things about symbolic languages is there is, you know, there's a concrete instantiation of what's going on. Um, yep. And, uh, you know, for category theory, I mean, is it the case that what you are building with your whole state box thing and so on, is that an attempt to make a concretification of what one can do with category theory. Is that uh, yeah, in part, like uh, obviously being a startup, we are trying, uh, you know, to, to build the product uh, before like uh, building- Before the money theory. runs out. Yes, like our, our main purpose is basically building a product. Uh, but yeah, we are. We, we think that the categorical perspective uh, will help us a lot. Is actually helping us a lot. So let's say that we are concretifying category theory up to the point that is useful for us. But in general, let me see if I have it here. There's a nice book uh, about applied category theory by David Spivak and Brendan Fong. Um, let me just see if I can find it. Uh, I think I, I think I may even have this book. I, I, I've, I've tried to do my homework in this area, but... but um... Yes, this one. Um, and I think it's quite nice. There is also a nice book by, by Emily Real. Um, and, you know, all these books are very uh, full of examples. It's like, okay, this categorical gadget can be used to model this, let's say, real world kind of thing. And uh, by the way, we are also with Statebox uh, giving some um, category training courses for business. And, and that's also the perspective we embrace. Like we present an argument and shortly after we present examples. I think is the only reasonable way to, to understand category theory, especially for applied people. For pure mathematicians, my own suggestion is still to study from the McLean's book which is a hard book for sure, but at least that it doesn't fool you. Like I remember that one of my, of the most disappointing things that happened to me in the beginning is that I started um, studying category theory on this uh, book, uh, which was very easy. And, you know, it would give you a lot of examples uh, that seemed reasonable, but actually the book was, uh, let's say just indulging on my set theoretic 
understanding of things. So every time I was like, oh yeah, okay, I get this, this is nice. Oh yeah, I get this. And then at page like 200, it finally introduces a junctions that are really not easily understandable from a set theoretic point of view. And at that point, I realized I didn't understand shit. Like literally, I just wasted one month of my life thinking I was understanding stuff and I didn't understand anything. At least McLean is honest. Like it, it may take one week to go through 10 pages, but when you go through them, and uh, then you really understand what's going on. So it's really slow and incremental progress. And everyone right. was... Well, let's see whether I can fit it into a lifetime, so to speak, uh, understanding <laughs> how category theory works. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not it's the, an it's, impossible it's the, task. The categorical <laughs> way is the, um, uh, yeah, all right. Well, we should wrap up here. Well, thank you very yeah. much. And um, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, uh, thank um, you. It was yeah. a nice chat. Yeah. Bye, Thanks guys. a lot. Okay.